Oh, oh, we're live. Is is this thing on? No, it's it not. Sure is, Grandpa. Uh, J Jim R. R. Martin here from the Fantasy Network. Uh, I have not completed wins yet, but I am here on BookTube tonight. You know, I I've been very cautious of coming on to BookTube, but Jimmy's such a great guy. Alex, Lana, huge fans of the channel, and uh, I saw a very uh, I would say in poor taste skit about me uh, from a, a Donald Green, but. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go to the other side of Booktube with the good people, and uh, we're here tonight to talk about a storm. So, all right, I, I'm, I'm going into a Brooklyn accent for some reason. Hey, everybody, it's me, Jimmy Nuts. With your... It's very Roy of you to just like, switch accents. Jimmy, sense. that's you? <laughs> well, I know. Uh, surprise, surprise. I'm back. Uh, I feel so lied to. Well, I'm sorry that I deceived you. Alex was fanboying prior to the stream. He was going crazy. Um, had a really I thought, I thought we landed the man himself. <laughs> Leanna now, failed to what, be impressed. What do I do now? Leanna sniffed it out from the get go. I don't know. She should be a detective. I really think. I so. think I'm the red woman and I can smell your lies. <laughs> I could see I could see you being a re red priestess. I could. <laughs> I could see that. Um, hey, we're here for a Storm of Swords live stream to talk some spoilers. Uh, we're kind of doing this reread and a read along for some of the people that are watching. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. And this happens to be my favorite book of all time. I'm, of course, joined by Alex Neves and Leanna's from Leanna's Library. And uh, yeah, how are you guys doing? I don't know how this is your favorite book. Literally nothing happens in, in this book. It's like the least eventful a Song of Ice and Fire book ever hey, I, published. I, I meandered a little bit. <laughs> It's going to be very confusing as you switch back and forth identity is like it's multiple personality disorder over there. Much like my writing, I'm going to break the perspective rules and screw it all. I don't also, I just like would like you to know that the way that the mustache dips makes your nose look enormous. <laughs> like it looks like part of your lip is part of your nose. <laughs> that hurts my feelings, but I, I uh, <laughs> thanks, I guess <laughs> I can't change my nose. I don't know what to do in this beard. I mean, it took me forever to grow it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, that's it took actually you a whole month impressive. to grow it because last time we saw you, you didn't yeah. have it. So it's, that's impressive. Listen, it took me 25 minutes to get suspenders on, and the grace of my wife helping me because the look, the the like here, let me just move this up. You see these? How do you get these things to line up, folks? Are there any scholars or gentlemen in the chat that can help me out? Because I am neither. Get a um, hipster. Hipsters can help you. Let me tell you what, though, this beard. Going in my mouth, horrible, awful. Yuck. I don't know how George does it. I'm telling you, you need a straw for your whiskey. You're right. Speaking of whiskey, uh, are, are we all doing a, a drink tonight? We're doing a drink. Not whiskey. I mean, I literally, I cannot wear this sweater and not drink. I'm pretty sure those are Oh, yeah, rules. I didn't even notice. That's a great sweater. I am drinking <laughs> House Tully tonight. Uh, Rip Hoster. Uh, good man. Well, not really, but a man. I'm not as big a fan as Jimmy, but I'm a bigger fan than Alex because I have of Game of Thrones Tullys? whiskey, but only Stark. I don't have all of the houses like Jimmy. I'm, I'm working on it. I have to have one for each stream as we go through all these. Apparently. <laughs> oh, I saw it in your your book tour, your shelf tour. You had like all of them lined up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I almost didn't show that because I didn't want people to think I'm an alcoholic because I actually don't drink that much. But I'm like, well, whatever. Okay. They're all empty. He's just drank all of them. It's true. They're just they're just canisters now. Apparently, I look like a bit like a clown, which which um, again kind of hurts my feelings. That's good. Uh, You're a very classy clown with glasses. Hey, you. it'd be worse if they said you look like a clown and you weren't dressed up. <laughs> this is true. I mean, <laughs> if you want to see me be a clown, watch me try to review books. But uh, hey. thankfully, this is in the long form, and we can do whatever we want. Um, and we can blame the alcohol. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So. We've kind of talked about the prologue each time we've done one of these. And I know I, I actually really like this prologue. I do think why? Clash of Kings prologue is better, but I love how much. I Jen... wonder why you like a Clash of Kings better, Jim. Is it because you love Stannis? It, it, it actually is because I love Stannis. But I also just like love that prologue. Yeah, um, I do th think, I mean, my favorite prologue, I, th I, I don't remember what the prologues are in Feast for Crows and... Dance with Dragons, but of these three, the, my favorite prologue is for sure Clash of Kings. Yeah, yeah, I think Clash is my favorite. I, I actually really like Feast as well. Feast is uh, whenever they're at ha um, um, Old Town, and Alaris the Sphinx is there. It's just kind of, it's kind of, it's much more like on the down though. It's not like a super. 
impactful one. Yeah, it's not White Walkers jumping out or yeah. if, well, let's talk about this prologue. I mean, yeah. we 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 get the white we get the others. The horn blows three times at the first time in like a thousand years or whatever. Um, and we have Chet the end. Chode. Yeah. What do you guys think of Chet? I mean, he's a douchebag. You think? <laughs> just a little. <laughs> just a wee bit. Leanna, I mean, are, are you team Chet or no? How are, how is anyone team Chet? Well, listen, I think I think he's Remember, this is a guy that's team Baratheon, so he doesn't listen. understand how humans work. Hey. So I'm Jimmy saying. is Baratheon number one, apparently Tully number two, and then Chet. Is is that the uh, No, I know I'm not saying I am team Chet. I'm just saying that Chet it's, has I mean he's dressed like a hipster and those are pretty hipstery takes, so <laughs> Well, I think that I think that Chet was bullied and now he's a bully. I think he's projecting while also bearing that his That can be for said for like ninety percent of the characters no. in Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, he was going to gut say I'm in the middle of the night, which was not cool. Uh, but when you learn about his troubled backstory. <laughs> so, okay, just because I don't rem- recall from the show, was Chet the weirdo that, like, was drinking from the skull? And Because I know they changed it all. Um, like, later on when they overthrow the Lord Commander, like, is that was that Chet? I Maybe don't. City. I actually don't have any recollection of it, to be honest. I think it was. Anyway, doesn't matter. It's not important. But yeah, Quick I mean, technical but... question: Does anyone else hear? It might be my headphones, like a high pitched like noise. I do not. Okay, it's if it's just me. That I, I don't me. hear anything. No, I, I do not. Um, I'm gonna have to look them up. I'm turning up my headphones now to see. But yeah, I mean, the, the prologue was cool because the especially the I mean the end of it when you do hear the horn going off and you just, you see them like going through, like thinking about like, they hear the one horn and then the second one. And then you get that third horn blow and they're just like, Oh my God. Yeah. It's kind of, and, and even as a reader, I mean, if you were reading for the first time, you would probably also wonder, you know, if, if it was going to blow for the third time. Um, I thought it was really funny that Chet, was talking about how clever and smart he was and how he was aiming second while his plan is just on a house of cards. It, it could fall apart from three different angles, but he's talking about how good his plan is all the while still thinking about. I feel like anybody who thinks their plan is good is dumb because most people know that like, even if you've like thought of every angle that you could, you're like so many things could still go wrong. And because you're the kind of person that's thinking that way, that means your plan is probably pretty solid. But if you're like, my plan is solid, like, oh, you're an idiot and your plan is not solid. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Um. It's also funny that he thinks that Half Hand and John are out there giving up information. He talks about how Sam's a coward, but the prologue ends with him peeing his pants. Yeah, yeah. I thought that was a nice touch, and we got George, like his backstory. Are we going to spend the entire live talking about just the prologue? Because you know, there's like 900 pages after that. I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> I don't know. I just like the I, I just like the fact that Germ always seems to flesh out the backstories mm-hmm. for these side characters, and whenever he does that, he obviously builds out the world. Even when he's talking to the other boys about what they're going to do when they get away. They're all talking about different places, and uh, I think it gives you kind of a glimpse. It definitely makes the world feel more lived in. Like, that yeah. it isn't just, like, so many other worse written books feel very much like, oh, okay, we built out, like, this scene where the characters currently are, and there everything else is blank space that doesn't exist because the book didn't need it for a scene. Yeah, that's exact. That's that's how I feel as well. I, it's great, um, though, because, again, we don't get a lot of the others in the books. So, true. Like, and again, you don't even really see them, but just the fact that you know that they're there. Yeah. And, and I thought George did a really good job of making it feel important. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought it was pretty vivid. Um, it, it, like George doesn't write like the most impressive combat of all time, but he does know how to build tension very, very well. Yeah. In this book, he does it. Well, I feel like when writing times. combat, like that is the only way to write it because like it's you really can't do like epic action on page the way you do on screen because like you're just describing a bunch of logistics. Whereas yeah. like the only thing that's going to make a battle or violence impactful for a reader is going to be the emotional stakes of the situation, the tension of it. So like, that's yeah. the important part in a book. Yeah. I think for mass appeal, especially, right? Like there's people who really enjoy certain aspects of military combat or whatever. Like I know Alan like loves sieges and formations and all this stuff. But even uh, then it'll be like the strategy that they're applying. If you're literally describing like the currently the siege and like, 
the catapult swinging and the wall breaking like yes you need to describe some of that to have a sense of this what's going on but that's not exciting the way it is in a movie like the thing that's going to be exciting or tense or interesting to you is like what this means for the characters or like what they're for how that's affecting them yeah yeah and i think that like that's the uh the secret sauce of combat is because everyone knows what tension feels like to be nervous and have your heart beating in your ears and that kind of thing um so i think if you could be, if you could do anything correctly, that is the thing to do correctly. Yeah. Um, which yeah. I definitely got from these. There are, um, again, the worst written books are so many books that feel like they've watched movies that open with like a Bond style action scene. So they decide yeah. to open their book like that. And I'm like, I don't know who these people are. I don't know what any of this is. You can't just like describe a bunch of limbs flailing and blood pouring. And I'm like, okay, who cares? <laughs> yeah. Without, you know, we see, uh, we could just turn on the news if we want to see that. We, you know, we, we need to or be no, like, like it works in a movie if you open like that, because like it is a visual spectacle. So you still like, you don't actually like care about what's going on because you don't know these characters yet, but at least like it is very impressive to look at. But in a book, you're like, I literally don't care about any of this. <laughs> Who is yeah, this? <laughs> that's actually a pretty good point too because you don't get to see the spectacle mm -mm. um and there's probably maybe a handful of authors that can do combat in a way to make people whoa yeah you know I mean? so um i guess we'll let's start we'll just kind of go through the characters i think that we did that last time i thought it was really good yeah. um can we talk about sam samwell because i feel like samwell gets hate but i think samwell plays like a really in he gets in hate in the book do you mean outside the book outside the book a lot of people hate samwell's povs um and him as a character, which I think is interesting because I think Samwell is like the argument against the fact that people say that A Song of Ice and Fire is nihilistic and uh, only negative, only depressing things. Whereas I find a lot of charm. A little and, puppy dog. Yeah, like in Samwell, I, I hate to tell you folks, I think he's going to be a hero in the end. I think he is the. Well, I'm pretty player. sure at the end of the story, he's going to be writing A Song of Ice and Fire. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, are we. <laughs> Maybe are we doing this right now? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um, his his archery skills are constantly being mentioned. Um, I do think that there's some sort of correlation for him or, or, or way for him to become um, a hero. But just in general, man, like Samwell's such a good dude. He never returns like that viciousness back to people who are just awful to him. Um, Which and is everybody, I mean, honestly, everybody. like if it was like a matter of you know he's fine and all, but his 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 chapters are kind of boring or something like that i mean i would have to disagree because of like he happens to be where a lot of action is going on so like mm -hmm. even if you're not a fan of him personally which like fuck you but like if you're not a fan of him personally he's still got eyes on really interesting things happening so like even you know if you don't care for him the yeah. chapters he heads you will be seeing interesting things unlike Daenerys, whose cha chapters do bore me more often than not <laughs> i mean he's thoroughly smart he's killed a freaking white walker like, sam, sam the slayer sam, sam the slayer people. yeah who's sam come on now stop it who is sam again no stop it so i mean also if you think about it uh we see lord commander mormont go down through his pov yep we get cold hands Yep. Uh, which is also interesting because we get the black gate. Like we get a lot of, uh, of the lore from Samwell's point of mm -hmm. view, because he's the one reading. He's the one looking at the old scrolls. He meets cold hands and talks about the black gate and how only certain things can go through, which I, I read something that was really interesting talking about how the oath of the night's watch could actually end up being like kind of a spell, you know, mm -hmm. or, or something like that, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then obviously the prologue, like we, 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 we actually get to see. Yeah. We know you like the prologue. <laughs> Long from the prologue. But so <laughs> Sam's so important. He is. Um, yeah, yeah he's important. Super Gaines Bro says, especially because well, Gaines chapters are so. It's sick. also kind of interesting and telling um when George chooses to have because I mean, generally speaking, and it's largely true in Song of Ice and Fire, but definitely true in general in multiple POV books. You usually kind of like have a POV to give you like perspective on a particular area, be it like a particular a faction or a particular mm -hmm. place or whatever and like the fact that the places in this book or the these books where we have multiple eyes on the same thing because like arguably john and sam are kind of redundant like yeah. they have both povs and there's a lot of that oh, also expands and Tyrion for a while seem redundant mm -hmm. and like the t the times when we have redundancy like that is often the most interesting in, you in get a different books. perspective you're not just getting like a lot of Danny's POV obviously is like 
she is your eye into it. But I feel like that's part of why I find Danny so boring is because like you don't have that complication of like, okay, we've seen it from different eyes and we've seen how actually it's not just one way. It depends on who's looking at it. And with Danny, we only have how she's looking at it. So I'm like, I guess I'll take your word for it. Yeah, I think that that's why there's a lot of upside possibly for Danny in the Winds of Winter and beyond because we're going to get Barristan. Obviously, Tyrion's over there now. Her and Um, John doing it. Jorah. Yeah, yeah, Jorah as well. I mean, there there could be a lot of... um, Daria. Yeah, a lot of different perspectives that help build out around her, hopefully, um, in in Winds. Um, How about Samwell just being really good at politics, though, at the wall, at the end of the book? It's like... The last guy I would expect to tell a lie. Well, except that I feel like George R. R. Martin has said that quite well because, like, the kind of person that has never been able to rely on physical strength or even mm-hmm. on like good mm-hmm. looks and charm, he's always had to find like it's kind of like like the woman's strategy of like you find the back door way, you find if you find ways to play people against each other so that you end up getting what you want because you can't you don't actually have a say, you don't actually have power, people don't actually listen to you, but like getting them to like manipulating people in this like backdoor way i feel like it's so what sam would have had to do his whole life without knowing that he's doing it so then when it comes to like doing it for john like he's kind of a natural at it yeah and and he is doing it for john right like sam doesn't do anything for personal gain Mm. jilly oh god (laughs) yeah roy roy for those who don't know in the audiobook calls (laughs) He says Jilly. And, he also and it, says Gendry. He's got he's a, a big problem with G's. Yeah, he has a big problem with G's and E E N E. I don't know. He's got a lot of problems with pronunciation in general. Well, he words. doesn't have any problems. Words are not his strong suit. <laughs> yes. He, he uh, rest his soul. He was uh, one of a kind. I don't know what he was on when he did these books audio wise but actually speaking of that i was thinking um because you know how andy circus did like re-recorded all of lord of the rings and i was just thinking yeah. i was like if you had you know like a cast member from a song from the game of thrones show re-record all the audiobooks who would you want to have do it oh that's a good question if it was a single person doing the entire yeah, just thing. like andy circus did all of lord of the rings huh well, i was neither... thinking probably sean bean I was just, uh, you know uh viserys did night oh, of the seven yes. kingdoms which he did a great job mm-hmm. But I think I'd actually pick Varys, uh, whoever plays Varys. I don't know the actor's That'd name. That'd be a good reading voice. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Very soothing. Um, I'm just thinking, though, because like Andy Serkis is like famous for like doing voices. So like he can yeah. do multiple characters. So like who would be the most versatile, you know, like that they're not too sounding like themselves all of the time, you know? Yeah. Peter Dinklage would be fantastic. Yeah, he probably would. Be. I mean, there's so many good voices. Charles Dance. But Charles Dance, I almost said, but then I was like, he would just sound like Charles Dance the whole time. I don't see him well, doing voices. Any of them would, though. Oh, yeah, the guy who did Fire and Blood. That's Simon Vance. Yeah, I think it's Simon Vance. I might be wrong. The guy who did Stannis. It'd be such a cold, monotone book, but I'd be there for it. You know, it I'd could be it. one of the ladies as well. Melisandre. <laughs> some great female actresses. I feel like Varys would be able Honestly, to Honestly, Lena be... Headey would probably be pretty good. Be yeah. Good. Yeah, she would, actually. I feel like Varys has the most. Uh, hi. <laughs> I feel Arya would not be good. No, too young. Um, Sophie Turner would not be good, or whatever. Sophie Jonas, what was her name? I don't know. Yes. Anyway, yeah. Anyways, no, that's a good question. I like that question because we seemed... get to decide. George R. R. Martin is here tonight, so we get yes. to tell him who we want. I'm gonna go back to Penguin Random House and figure out what uh, what we can do. Because you've seen the error of your ways with Roy. You feel real bad about that. I do. I feel terrible. Poor Roy. Um, Whatever. He's fine. Let's jump to uh, let's jump to Essos. Let's talk about Danny because we, we were kind of talking about her anyways and kind of already yeah, so uh, crapping on her. Let's just, you know, get that out of the way so we can get to the interesting stuff. You know what we forgot? We <laughs> forgot in A Clash of Kings that Barristan shows up and joins her. We totally forgot about this. You forgot about it. You're the well, big fan. <laughs> well, we, well, yeah, you're right. You're right. It was not in my notes. Gosh. Now I feel like I have to double check myself. Um, but I, th- I, I love Barristan Selmy. He's a badass. I, I, I kind of ranted about him when we, when we read Game of Thrones. I like um, him fine, but why do you love him? Barristan? Because he's the, he's the one person Jamie's like, oh, I couldn't beat him. That's fine. But just like as a character to read about, I mean, like, oh, yeah, that guy. But I'm not like, oh, I love that guy. Oh, I did. he's a legend. He's yeah. an absolute I mean, legend. Yeah, in the universe of the books, he's a legend, but he's not that interesting to read about. See, I disagree. I don't know. I, I like it's the. There's like not a million layers to that to unpack. Sir, 
Sure there is. I mean, he think about it. He turned on Daenerys's father and then shows up to be with Daenerys. I mean, th there, there's a whole underlying tone of where loyalty lie or where his loyalties should have lied, where they do lie now. Uh, and what happened at the tourney of Harrenhal with Barris and Selmy? Because Barris and Selmy apparently lost to Rhaegar. And he said, I wish I would have been more of a noble knight. I think it, that's that's the word to use is at Harrenhal. And if he had, things might have been completely different. So I, I don't know. I find Barrison to be really interesting. I would like to get more POVs from him because he has a lot of information that no one else has. Because a lot of people who are at the tourney are I mean, like, I don't have anything against him. And all what you said is true. I just feel like there's so many characters that have like so much to them, both in terms of personality and situation, that like I reserve the word love in like as far as these characters go for like someone like Jamie. But you know, I Barrison is like, yeah, he's interesting. That we said, let's talk about Danny's POV. And it's been a two minute conversation about Barristan. And how Jimmy because no one cares about Danny and George R. R. Martin over here just proved it. <laughs> Except Danny is super impactful because this book is when she gets the Unsullied and burns the freaking slavers and asks for and dresses them all down like a bad I mean, I do ass. think the most interesting thing, I feel like Barristan Selmy, I don't think, okay, so this kind of reminds me of like when every single time, if you meet him, he will ask you this too. Pierce Brown always asks, who's your favorite character in the Red Rising books? And I never have an answer. But like, my favorite thing that I could tell him was that it was like my favorite thing was that the new books had different POVs so we could see Darrow through someone else's eyes. So similarly, I don't think Barrison is that interesting a character, but I think he like his presence and like who he is, where he's been creates interesting situations and scenes. Like I don't give honestly two shits about him, but like the fact that he's able to tell Danny more about the Targaryen background that she's only ever heard about from her brother, who's obviously going to lie to her or at least misrepresent things um, selfishly. So like the fact of him being there creates interesting opportunities. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, and he does start giving her tidbits about Rhaegar, right. When, whenever she's yeah. ready and Danny and spends... about the man King. Yeah. yeah. And, and her, and her father and also kind of, puts Danny in a mindset where she thinks constantly in this book about Rhaegar. She thinks constantly, what would Rhaegar do? And she starts asking, am I mad? Yes. And that, yeah, actually, I did. Yeah, you're you're right. I forgot about that. Because I think she says it after she burns the slavers and she's walking through, right? Yeah, well, she's just saying, I did. That was justified, though, right? No, that was, am I mad? No, that was, no, that was justified, what I did. It yeah. was no, that was, that was fine. That was fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. I mean, like, you know, the horrible <laughs> shit that they were doing, though. Like, yeah. just the, the way that, because I think it was like a slow buildup, right? Because when she's talking to the, in S4, like talking to, the, I forget the guy's name, and he's just like, thinks that she doesn't understand him, and it's just like talking shit the whole time, and like the whole like translator going back and forth, mm -hmm. and then saying everything that the Unsullied have to go through to become Unsullied, it's just like horrendous shit that they get put through killing puppies killing puppies killing literally babies, killing puppies literally killing babies in front of the moms like all of the stuff that they go through is just terrible and then yeah badass and she takes them all and i think this this moment kind of gets overlooked because everyone says oh the red wedding the purple wedding um that's you know, so much happened in this book. Tyrion yeah that's what i'm saying that this book is chocked full of stuff and i and i forgot that she burned the slavers in this book I and that, like everything for like five seasons of game of thrones happens in this book i so. came up with the perfect analogy for what this book is All so you know in lilo and stitch <laughs> <laughs> when Lilo tells Stitch, you know, you you always wreck everything you touch. Why don't you try making something for a change? And he takes her toys and books and he builds this like cool, like like life like looking little city. Same and then this, yeah. Storm of Swords is Stitch tromping through and destroying it like Godzilla. <laughs> so the first two books is like building <laughs> this cool little, little world, and then this book is just stomping through and destroying it all. It's actually really yeah, that that's spot on. <laughs> and a lot of it's foreshadowed like we talked about it last time mm -hmm. in the clash of kings and and it's some of the foreshadowing just absolutely insane i mean um, quake comes back too in this book and says like the same to like to go back you have to go forward or to go forward you have to, whatever she says the, yeah the weird props, east or yeah. west and whatever yeah. else which kind of points her to a shy which i hope we end up seeing in the books that'd be amazing um oh yeah by the way when the slavers were burning did you notice that the bells were ringing don't start they were. The don't bells start. were ringing in her hair. I don't, I don't care. Don't start. If you, if you do a word search on a search of ice and fire and you yeah. look at the bells, it's like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, no. I'm not I'm not going to hear it. 
Oh, man. Not entertaining that, especially the way that it happened in the show. Don't get me started. Yeah, well, it'd definitely be better than that, for sure. Yeah. Um. Oh, Martin has said we won't see a shy. Well, if that's true, that's a bummer. But he I still also... hasn't even written the next book, so I don't believe shit that he Wait, said. Wait, has he said we won't see it in Winds of Winter, or we won't see it at all in The Song of Ice and Fire? Because, like, after Winds of Winter, there's still one more to go. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see a shy. I could see why he wouldn't want to go there, but I would really prefer to see it. It's, I think it's one of the coolest pieces of... Uh, well, then, George, write it. I, 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 you know, I got my hands full. I have these book two videos now. The only make. reason I could see him not expanding it further is because then he'd have to, like, expand it further. And, like, then we'll end yeah. up with a 10-book series. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you can make a strong argument that there's no Then it becomes, like, a seven-book series, and then it just never finishes. Yeah, his seven-book trilogy... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Kevin Mike says, I wonder if a storm of swords is like that because the series was originally intended as a trilogy. I think so. I mean, obviously he knew that he was going to go past that uh, when he wrote it, but yeah, I it's think like a packing little... a suitcase be like, I could fit a little more. in there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it really is an arc. I think one, two and three are an arc. And then four and five are the beginning of something new. And I feel like the winds of winter is so important for it all it to come together and make sense. And I think that, uh, you know, if if or when we ever get the winds of winter, I think we'll look back at feast and dance probably and say, oh, OK, I see what he was doing. But without that and waiting 10 years, it, it, it's difficult to get really excited. We'll about probably talk about arc. this more when we write when sure. we read feast. But like, what do we just generally think about? Like, do you think that was a good idea? The way in which it was split, where it was like instead of splitting it chronologically, it was split as like, here's some of the POVs and here's the other POVs. Yeah. Like, I don't think that was a good idea, frankly. I, I actually agree. I think. Yeah, I mean, it ends up making some of it feel like filler, right? It I mean, it feels like, like that not... fourth season of Arrested Development where they decided to do episodes that focus on one character <laughs> alone. And you're like, but it works because it's an ensemble. Like, it doesn't yeah. work when you just do this one like, part. Kind of it kind of slows everything down, too. Yeah. Yeah, it, def it definitely uh, slows a lot of things down. And if I've been reading these when they came out, I've been pissed to wait seven years. I mean, I'm pissed I'm waiting 10 years for a Tyrion chapter, right? But yeah, I, I could see why people would be out. It's kind of like uh, Dark Tower Song of Susanna is very frowned upon. But if you read it in a binge, it's really not that bad. But people waited a long time for it, and they were upset that it was yeah. like, yay thin. Same with Wheel um, of Time. I mean, the slog yeah. existed for a reason. You now you wait that, that many years, and then you get three books where not a whole lot of like plot happens. And you're just like, what the fuck? Do we know if it was George R. R. Martin's idea to split it that way, or if it was like the publisher and editor who were like, so he, do it like this? They, they made him split it. They made him but, split I mean, it. You don't have to split it by like POVs. You can just split it straight chronologically. Yeah, I assume that was his idea, but he apparently they were one book, and it was like, I, you, someone look it up, but I want to say it was like 1600 manuscript pages, and they're like, George, yeah. we can't do this. Like, it's not possible. Um, now, I think if they could have had it, they would have said sure, because we probably would have been able to get along further. Yeah. Uh, with that out but it is what it is uh, th there's a really interesting podcast called uh, not a cast uh, by and it has brendan b fish on there he's a really good uh reddit poster but uh he has a episode i want to listen to and it's him defending the five-year gap because i tend to think it was a mistake not to do to it not do it but he and he's way smarter than i am and then he's i mean he's probably one of the smartest guys when it comes to this stuff and he defends it so i'm curious to see what he thinks and i'm sure we'll talk about it more but um, i mean like the other where I'm just thinking, like, it is weird how young they all are, but, like, where would you put the five years? Like, everything happens so, like, and you they're all, like, direct. It. That would be the issue, because, like, if you think about everything that happens in this it's book, such a chain if all reaction. of a sudden there was a, a five-year split, it would be like, so what were they doing for five years? Like, you either have to gloss over a lot of stuff or yeah. act like nothing happened, which both yeah. feels kind of bad. Well, because, I, like, you would immediately react i mean i guess if you so could cumulatively that. have a five-year gap where like every a bunch of things took slightly longer than they did and then yeah. you end up with five years like okay i could see that where like it takes longer for ned to figure stuff out in king's landing it takes slightly longer for these kings to like come up but and that's like rewriting the whole series and making it longer. yeah but that's the only way i could see it working is if you distribute the five years kind of across different things so that by the net result is like more time has gone by yeah. but like an uh one chunk of five years like where do you put that did they all fall asleep for five years <laughs> yeah I, I think it's a really difficult thing to do and but i don't know if you all felt this way but at the they end were in fugue for five years. yeah they just put him in cryo sleep yeah. but i felt at the end of danny's last chapter like you can see him setting up a time jump almost because sure. she's like i'm going to rule 
And it's like, oh, okay. Like what's for you know, Danny, you... that makes sense because she's so mm-hmm. again, she's so separated. She like just got her yeah. army. She takes over. Like she... I guess I could see Stannis camping out for a little while up north. Well, cause, yeah, I mean Stannis makes sense because he's like in ruins. Danny makes sense. She just got her army. She has to sail to Westeros. She just took over Yonkai. And she has Young Sully. She's got the uh Tommen is up in it. What are they called? He needs to grow up. Yeah, because yeah. he's like eight. How old is Tommen? I think he is eight. Yeah. Tommen is eight in feast. Okay. So, I mean, I think he's eight here. Because they're already eight. talking about Marjorie marrying him. But anyway. Yeah, so oh. like you gotta deal with Marine. Like it makes sense from Danny's perspective that the time jump would have happened, but yeah. Who knows? <laughs> Misa Misa. What a cool Oh man. And the bear and I know we already talked about Barrison, but his reveal at the end of the book I thought was badass. Like we talked about like tension and stuff, but like I his felt reveal like meaning was... when he reveals who he is. Yeah, her. whenever yeah. he reveals yeah. who he is. And uh oh by the way, Jorah is the worst ever. He's such a creep. Dude, he's well, also, like... I mean, like the way she thinks to herself, like when his reaction is still indignant, yeah. and she's like, You should have begged. Like, I would have forgiven you, but like, sir, where do you get off? <laughs> oh, dude, when she sends him away. I mean, it's just one of those things where, again, if you were a first timer, you're like, will we see Jorah again? Because it almost feels like a write off. Um, yeah. But if they're not dead, end. you know that there's going to be stuff with them. No one is ever done until they're dead. I mean, it is uncomfortable to read some of the Jorah and just him thinking like, or, you know, or what she thinks he's thinking. It's 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 really gross. Yeah, you always have to remember that she's like 13 and he's what like 38 or whatever i don't yeah, know what, whatever well, then, i mean okay i would just like i mean george r. r martin has several older men lusting after 13 year olds because sansa and peter baelish also Ow. she Ow. is 13 well because you have to remember like the the show did a lot of like removing that aspect of it because they tried Plus to also make, sansa like... looked more like 16 17 which is still creepy yeah. but it's not nearly as creepy as a 13 year old well because i mean we could talk about it when we talk about sansa and or Tyrion, but like Tyrion straight up was like I want Alex, whatever you're doing with your headphones is making a lot of noise. <laughs> like unlike the TV show where he's just like, I'm gonna respect you and like stay away from you. In the books, he's like, I'm gonna respect you, but like I also still want to get in bed with you. So like if we could do that, that'd be great. It's just like, dude, you're kind of weird. Yeah, Tyrion's definitely a perv for sure. Yeah. Like Although I still feel like with like as compared to Jorah and Peter, like Tyrion's like, okay, we are married and we're expected to do this. Like he's grossed out by the very notion of it. He's like, okay, but like we have to do this. So like let's make the best of it. And he didn't. And he didn't force himself. Like he Whereas the other two, like they are not married. There is no reason to be doing this. Like they're just creeping. I the only notes I have for Sansa are poor, poor Sansa. (laughs) Peter is disgusting. Bye bye, Liza. Man, but Liza, at least Peter, like, well, Peter is never going to be somebody that you can trust because he's always working for numero uno. He mm-hmm. is more in her corner than anyone has been so far. So, it's like, true. it would be a relief to like, okay, you can creep on me as long as you're not trying to, like, kill me and my family. <laughs> Although he did low key murder her aunt, but like, that was fine and we were okay with that. <laughs> All right, there, wait. there was nothing low key about it, but when it <laughs> says he's the creep, for God's sake, there are so many creeper things in this book. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it, he's creepy though. It doesn't nullify him being. We're talking creepy. strictly like pedophile kind of creepy. Yeah. Well, it's also it's because like generally speaking, it's a character that has been that you would regard more positively in terms of the role they serve mm-hmm. and like they have done good things for your the characters you're rooting for, and the fact that they're being so creepy. Well, I mean, Peter, he's also villainous, but like Jorah is like this person that like she's looked to has been her protector has but has like obviously abused that situation because she learned it. Yeah. God, it's so brutal. Yeah. Um, seeing Sansa be helpless, completely helpless yeah. with ever who, who will be able to actually like step up to the plate. And no one is a really good option. Uh, you almost wish she would have. Honestly, Terry um, was actually the best for her. He, like he was kind of looking out for her as best yeah. he could. Yeah. And yeah. she yeah. thanks of him. Yeah, she thinks of him. She's like, you know, maybe he wasn't the worst. You know, he, at yeah, least he was kind. Late. She realized that too late. Yeah, I'm trying to find um, the ghost of High Heart. Um, yeah. All right. So check this out. This is from. Um, let's see. Knock it down. OK, so whenever Arya is talking uh, to the ghost of High Heart, she sees like a giant being crushed in, in a castle of snow. 
right? And I'm sitting there. I'm like, what in the world is this prophecy? This is such a attack the wall. Yeah, well, here, this is it. It actually confirms in a storm of swords. And this is, uh, I think, a really interesting point uh, to how George does prophecies. Um, but it's this is from the book. It's not so great. The boy knelt before the gatehouse. Look, here comes a giant to knock it down. He stood his doll in the snow and moved it jerkily. Tromp, tromp, I'm a giant. I'm a giant. He chanted, ho, 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 open your gates or I'll smash them and smash them. Swinging the doll by the legs, he knocked off the top of the gatehouse tower and then the other. It was more than Sansa could stand. Robert stopped that. Instead, he swung the doll again and a foot of the wall exploded. She grabbed for his hand, but she caught the doll instead. Ruined the castle. There was a loud ripping sound as the thin cloth tore. Suddenly, she had the doll's head. Robert had the legs and the body. The, um, and the rag and sawdust stuffing was spilling out in the snow. Now, when you get the ghost of High Heart Prophecy, you're thinking, oh, man, are giants going to go overtake Winterfell? Like, is this wildlings? No. It was simply... Uh, you know, little uh, little dude playing in the snow and Sansa tearing the doll apart. And we get to see that. And I think it's really interesting because the other prophecies we see are Melisandre's who are so drastic and she takes everything to mean something, you know, epic. And it's like, well, maybe it's not. Maybe it's actually this, this simple. Because you every- do have to wonder why she like went all in for Stannis. Like, yeah. You're like, him, he that really guy. Wants to be right. Yeah, and he doesn't <laughs> have any of the everything has to do with his aura high. I know, but like, I feel like she could pick another more charismatic leader to be like, he seems like the guy. Yeah, it, <laughs> I, I thought that was so cool. And, and I remember I, I forgot about the high heart prophecy, but I remembered like, um, you know, the, the snow scene with the castle and the doll. And I still didn't put it together because I was also thinking this has to mean something very big and epic. It doesn't mean anything really at all. I mean, it happens, but it doesn't mean much. I mean, isn't it? Is it not the wildlings attacking the wall? No, it's. I think it's definitely uh, this giant. I mean, it's too. It's too on the nose. It has to be this. I think. But there's literally a giant that tears through a gate at the wall. Yeah, but then the giant is slayed within the castle walls. It's not even snow. It's snowy there. I mean, you're not wrong. So maybe it's open for interpretation. But I felt like it. It definitely foreshadowed Sansa, um, um, with little dude. I keep Robert. I keep forgetting his name. Um. But I thought that was interesting. Ghost of High Heart's awesome. Stan prophecies. She also has a dream that stands for Renly being murdered by shadows. Balon dying to a faceless man. Um, and also Lady Stoneheart. Those are all foreshadowed here. And we find out that Balon does die, which it's in the scheme one, of things. It's such a one-off, like, oh yeah, by the way, he fell off a fucking bridge. What a dumbass. Like, oh, all right, cool. Yeah, we just kind of write it off like, sure he did. Sure he slipped. He's an idiot. I mean, they do say that they have these like rickety ass bridges that go in between all these mountains over the water. And it was a real stormy night. Well, yeah. And then later in the other books, people don't even question it, really. They're just like, oh, yeah, sure. But in the grand scheme of this book, man, I don't even think about Balon Greyjoy. <laughs> It's no. honestly like his death isn't significant. It's the fact that his death proves that whatever Melisandre is doing seems to be effective. That's mm-hmm. the only reason you care about him being dead. Yeah. And the, and that the ghost of High Heart also is obviously seeing some vision, which makes you wonder. And she doesn't serve her lore. So you're like, is there something else that people are missing that are giving these visions? Um, there's also that always that debate of which religion is actually true in Westeros. Are any of them true? I, I don't think they all are. I was yep. going to say, I mean, they I are. think the thing is that none well, of them are it. religions. They're all just some piece of magic that seems to be working for you. And like, they're not, they're not religions it's because you've turned them into one. That That's why you're all messed up because like, it's not what's going on here. Yeah. It doesn't have to be revered in a like dogmatic way. Yeah. I mean, like trees that can see because of like the green seers and whatever you're like, I mean, that's magic. That does not mean you worship trees now. <laughs> like having, being able to like see the future in the flames. Okay. That's a good, yep work on that that seems useful but that does not mean you worship the fire now <laughs> <laughs> well, they form religions to to fit their narrative but yeah but that's because Weird. so i feel like what it's doing is like pointing out like how uh unhelpful it is to like now put blinders on and to choose to like only see this one type of thing as your religion and that oh, like sure that that's why you have this going on because not all these things are equally true. They're just all different tools at your disposal. And by choosing to be blind to everything except the one you picked is that's not got not a good idea, not an effective strategy. 
it is interesting that the old gods and the new do kind of coincide. Like the North obviously goes with the old gods and people seem to be respect that. But R'hllor is like the new religion, and people seem to be a little bit put off by it. And uh, you know, by the burning, yeah. I imagine probably uh... it's a foreigner's god. Exactly, I think they even refer to it as a foreigner's god. Um, yeah, whereas, like the the old gods of the north, you're like, well, it's you know, it's weird, but yeah, we're used to that. That's that's the homies of north, like. <laughs> Yeah. And their trees. That's like cold weirdos yeah. up in the And also, like, it's pretty harmless. You know, like, trees. oh, you want to like pray to some trees? Like, that's weird, but like, whatever. Versus like fire, you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Put it fire down. makes you think of the Targaryens, and then you think of Eris, and then it's all bad. It's that's just an true. inherently more violent kind of like thing they're going with than yeah. trees with faces. <laughs> Which, which which are kind of i mean they're, they're they're kind of interesting but they're also kind of creepy too a little creepy trees with faces yeah a little creepy yeah but it's not like Green you're like okay what's it, what's it gonna do like look at me like whatever go carve yeah. some faces and some trees <laughs> have a good time <laughs> i really liked aria's uh pov on this reread and I, I i'm finding myself enjoying her stuff a lot more than i remember on the other times oh, i always like liked it. aria's chapters I, I liked it but like i i found myself like really looking forward to the chapters um, and I forgot that Harwin resurfaces. I just always found Arya's chapters to be incredibly amusing. I mean, well, darkly amusing because her chapters were always like on the heels of someone else who's just been there, is about to be there, has currently affected this. Yeah. She's always like stumbling in where like somebody else that we're following has already like done a thing or she really should have met up with. Like she's always just just missing like boats, like ships in the night, always missing somebody. Yeah, always a misdirect with her. She was so close. To her mother at multiple yeah. times, like, and she like almost know. runs into Jamie. Mm -hmm. and yeah, she also works in this book. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Arya, it, it the Starks really start to become a lot more mythical, and mm -hmm. obviously Lady Stoneheart and stuff like that. But Rob um, works too. I mean, there's 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 a lot of working that doesn't really get explained, but you can kind of tell is happening. Yeah. Well, I mean, Arya too. Like, this is when she kind of like accepts that these aren't dreams, like that this is yeah. real. And like she doesn't know what to call it, and she wouldn't know that she's a war. But like when she mm -hmm. tells what's his name that she knows that her mom is dead because she saw it in a dream, and yeah. she like it's it's not a you get the sense from her that's not just like a oh the gods you know spoke to me in a dream. She's like no, I was a wolf in my dream, and I know that shit was real, and I saw yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, and, and she kind of starts to embrace the fact that that she is a lone wolf in a lot of ways, especially by the end of the book. You can tell that she knows she's going to have to go her own way. And then I think that's what sets up her chapters to be really, really interesting in, in the uh, next books that we're going to read. Um, Valar more gullis. <laughs> Whoa, what is that? What is that how Roy says it? Yes, he yeah, does. Terrible. But I was not I was on physical book, um, so I don't know how he pronounces um, the other one. Um, Valar de Hyrus. How does he say that one? Probably horribly. Probably oh, atrocious. Like. I don't remember. I just got whiskey and hair in my mouth. Oh God! I think he yeah, actually he pronounces it better than. Well, it'll still be oh, Valar, which is upsetting. Valar by Harris. <laughs> like terrible. <laughs> and of course, even though they're from Bravos, they sound like pirates. From everybody sounds like a pirate. Yeah, or Elmer Fudd. Yeah, yep. or an old hag. Here in the like Elmer Fudd. But yeah. so, I mean, with Arya, though, you get the Brotherhood. I was about to say, I love the Brotherhood without banners, dude. Oh yeah. my God. I love you get it. the whole scene of them like trying to threaten them. And they're just like, put your swords away. What are you idiots doing? Beric Dondarrion. I mean, <laughs> yeah, what man. a legend. What a you? legend. How many times has he died now? Like 10? Yeah. And too many. Too many. It, it's, it's interesting, too, because that's another example, right? Like, he clearly is brought back from the dead. Oh, yeah. Like, clear as day. Yeah. So we we kind of have to accept that this low fantasy world does have magic in it, and and it's all mm -hmm. it's all from the comet, it's all from dragons being reborn. It's so interesting. I love that. A lot of symbolism there. Um, I mean, you get you get all the brotherhood stuff, so you get obviously the hound surviving and not being found guilty, and then you get her as you're saying, like she's always like right behind other storylines going. Like she gets to the twins like right after the red wedding happens or yeah. it's happening like the tail end of it and gets to just kind of experience like being so close to your family and then literally everyone dying. Like, it's terrible. Where it's like, it's just as well. She was a little late because she could have been included in the red wedding. Oh, I mean, they would have yeah, her in for sure. And then the hound would have went on his separate way. I mean, yeah, in a lot of ways, Arya has dodged a bullet and it makes you wonder if, um, you know, there's a there's a reason that she's, she's always dodging a bullet. That's what she's always like. Just like she had like 
cross paths with Jamie, I don't see that necessarily ending well. Like she's always just missed something. Mm -hmm. Yep, her father's beheading. Yep. Uh, being ushered away. She uh, she meets Ned Bane, by the way, in this book. Um, and I don't think that name is a coincidence at all. Of course so, you so, don't. so check this. I mean, this is interesting. Not. Well, this is this is interesting because so we know that this is the canon, right? That Ned killed Arthur Dane, which is already suspect. He takes his sword back to Starfall. Mm -hmm. uh, Shara Dane kills herself. And then I love the name... explanation oh. that is given for that. <laughs> like I, when I... the story is told about like, didn't anybody ever tell you this story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no. And he's just like, well, let me tell you. And but did you notice Ned had no ill will towards Ned to, towards her or her dad? He didn't care at all. And he's named after Ned. So it, it's just like something doesn't add up there because if he had killed um, Arthur Dane, right? Why in the or, and if and let's say him and Ashara had had a thing and they and they they had had a breakup and he couldn't be with her and she killed herself over it just doesn't seem like it adds up like there's definitely a lot more to uh, what what happened in Starfall and I think we'll get to find that out hopefully from Barristan's POV maybe um, in, in the Winds of Winter but I just thought that was really interesting I think Ned Dane's an interesting character and a lot of people postulated the fact that he was supposed to be um, um, Dark Star that comes later down the road. Uh, Cause in the brotherhood without banners, he actually does not agree with what lady Starheart is going around and doing. Right. So he, he, he thinks that's the wrong thing to do. And the idea is that he would get jaded and become star um, dark star. Um, so I think he was supposed to be possibly the sword of the morning. And I think he'll probably end up getting dropped. Maybe have like a little cameo. Cause I think George said, we'll see him again, but I don't yeah. think he's going to play as big of a role, unfortunately, as what he would have with, uh, with the five year gap. Cause he's also very, very young. A lot of characters are super young. Yeah, Shauna says, hand to check your front door for a package when you're done. <laughs> but don't, you, you don't yeah, have to no. leave. Yeah. You can stay. You do it now. I'm saying like, got it. I, I, no, I meant, I meant just Shauna. She doesn't have to leave. Yeah. Said, okay. Geez, bye. Shauna. Get out of here then. <laughs> I thought Shauna was a fan of Song of Ice and Fire. Right. I mean, so also in Arya chapter though, you get the hound basically being left for dead. Yeah. Which, I mean, we are, are we all on the train of like, he's clearly the one that comes back like later in the village. Again, if you're yeah, not dead, digger. dead on page, you're not dead. Yeah, he's grave digger. And the thing is, is Arya, his name was on the list forever. And mm -hmm. and she doesn't kill him, right? She, well, she takes him off him. and then she adds him back. Yeah, and, you know, later down the line, they'll they'll think about it. Oh, she says, I'm still here, but I also suck at life and haven't been keeping up with this really long. Oops. Yeah, you're okay. You, you know, know what happens you know in the Storm deal. of Swords. It's just like a couple key moments. Just like all of the things. A few weddings, a few funerals. Dude, whatever uh, the hound says, he's going to take it. He's like, Ari, I'm taking you to your mom. I'm going to ransom you. And we got to make it in time for your uncle's bloody wedding. <laughs> it's like, oh, George, sorry. you cheeky bastard. But yeah, I mean, so the hound takes her, takes her there. And then it's too late. And then he's like, all right, we're going to the veil. And then the veil is just like not working out either. And then he almost dies. And Ari doesn't kill him and runs away. It's just, yeah. This man is just not, not living a good life. No, nah, he's had a pretty rough go of it since he left the keep, but I don't think he cares, honestly. No. I think he probably would have rather died that day if he could have. He um, was begging for it. It's true. Um, also, what about when Arya at the end like is just flat out murdering people? Like with all that rage and her emotions are coming out. Up. Yeah, you kind of see like the path that this kid's taking, and it's really it's it's kind of sad in, in a lot of ways. And it doesn't seem like she minds being a killer. Arya, no, that's why she's that's why she signs up for the career path mm -hmm. that she signs up for. Yeah. Yeah, it's like the the four, uh, there's a ton of building blocks there for her to have this all these traumatic experiences and finally take um I mean, honestly of... like she she killed her first person like in the first book, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. When she has so, the like, she's running away. And, and like, yeah, it was rough, but not that rough for her. <laughs> she was pretty okay with it. She's like, yeah, he was on the way. Oops, sorry. Look, Bye. She's kind of a sociopath. <laughs> okay, Grace says a lot more happened in this book than I remembered. I didn't think the Red Wedding and yeah. Joffrey happened in the same book. Arya getting on the boat. Yeah, and Tywin dying. Uh, like we said, you know, uh, the slavers. Yeah, so no, when I kept dying. reading, I was like, wait, I still have this, this, and There's this to so go. Like, much. that's still going to happen in this yeah. book. Like, this is insane. Yeah. So, okay. So, I mean, Arya 
Yeah, the stranger. I've already killed one fat boy. Yeah, it's a great line. I mean, her prayers nightly are for people to die. Yeah, she's yeah. literally going down a hit list. <laughs> yeah. And, and she starts to make it a reality. It, in a lot of ways, she's opposite of uh, Sansa because Sansa doesn't have control. She has to rely on everybody else, for now at least. And Arya is not. Arya is actually stepping up and, and taking her shots when she gets them and uh, seeing she it through. needle back. Yeah. Yeah, which is nice. All of her. Which is really nice. Someone said, and poor, poor. Oprah. I love that when she tells what's her name, the lady that takes her in and gives her the acorn dress that like her favorite like pastime is needlework. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was Not good. <laughs> like that whole conversation where like the whole time Arya's answers are like misdirects. Like, yeah. I was like, I like this wordplay. I've been known to stab once in a while, you know. We, uh, we talked about the Red Wedding a little bit, but I guess we can talk about, uh, Catelyn and, and yeah, everything. Um, the dip shit taking it's so taking bad. Walter Frey for granted. Yeah, Rob. Um, Rob's such an idiot at some points, but I also believe that he would make those decisions at that age. And oh, like, yeah. I mean, that... even Catelyn is like, he's 16. Like, I, yeah, and the phrase are a joke. Can. The phrase are a joke, but he's, I mean, he's made mistakes before that, though. Cause I mean, all he's did, he's winning battles and he thinks he's invincible. So, like, he goes and gets married to some hot chick, but. He, you know, he writes off the phrase, doesn't care about their word. He, you know, the uh, shit, what was the, the Karstarks kill the, the yes. young, the uh, young Lannister, the young Lannisters. And then Rob, you know, beheads them and sends them off. And he's like, all right, let's go to the twins. Like, we're still going to get them. They're fine. He's just, he's kind of like pompous and arrogant at this point, a little bit of like, yeah, he's not really thinking about like how anyone's going to react to all of in fairness though to before. rob like the like the tradition of guest right is like pretty sure. a, a pretty mean, big deal like so like it's yeah. so, like everyone warned him that he might lose the phrase but no one literally no one thought yeah. that like they'd get killed at a wedding because yeah. like you just don't do that yeah they didn't play by the rules yeah and um i thought when rob beheaded car stark was like one, I love that scene. Yeah, it's a lot of inner turmoil, uh, turmoil with him. But also, I think it's one of the best examples of a song of ice and fire being so much different than a lot of other series at the time, because I couldn't have seen that happening in a lot of other series. I just would, like forgive him and just move on. But he's like, no, like this is what it takes. Yeah, and it made it. I, I sympathize. Arab with Arab beheading Gimli because Gimli went off and did something that he shouldn't have. Yeah, yeah, it's. You know, it's um kind of like Boromir was, you know, he kind of redeemed himself at the end. And it felt like mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, like I, I was kind of upset with Robin that I get why he did it. I understand. But man, duty's hard because yeah. I felt a lot of empathy for Karstark. His sons were yeah. murdered, you know, Catelyn. And then he also, you know, the he, hypocrisy he of Catelyn literally standing right there. I mean, like, I kind of, you know, yeah, it's and, fine when I do it. <laughs> and yeah. And then you, so you're sitting here like it's the right thing, but you're inconsistent and nobody hates anything more. Everybody hates somebody that's inconsistent, a hypocrite. Everybody hates that. So, man, Rob, Rob's a mixed bag in this book. Um, and then he's a dead bag at the end. But I mean, you can get like <laughs> that's about the worst it's... description of Rob I've ever heard in my <laughs> life. I don't know if you can call it foreshadowing, but like Grey Wind doesn't like the phrase like as soon as they get there. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's like he's like he's telling you straight up. He's just like, I don't trust these people. And he's Which is again where like Catelyn's like... instincts are dead on when she's like even like before that when mm -hmm. like whoever it is that's around Rob and she's like Grey Wind doesn't like him. Get rid of him. And he's like, really, mom? He's like, I really if the, mm -hmm. your dog doesn't like anybody get rid of him. He's like, OK, OK, I'll, I'll get rid of him. <laughs> and he just and lets him kind of like put Grey Wind outside and lock him up. It's like. So, I mean, so the Red Wedding, though, I mean, as because, of course, it made me go back and watch the scene multiple oh, times, God. too. But like, it's just it's it's built up. But also, so. OK, but that's a really interesting change, because in the book, Jane is not there. Yeah. And in the show, she's there. So yep. like, there's no question of like, oh, she might be carrying his air and like there could be something there. So like, yeah. what do we think about that change? I mean, yeah, I mean, also, she's a Westerling in the book, right? Yeah, Wait, Jane Westerling. I don't remember what her name was in the show. Uh, she was supposed to come from Volantis, and she's supposed yeah. to be like exotic and all this other stuff. Which the Westerling I think is more interesting because it could have been a plant because they yeah. were bannermen for for Lannister. Yeah. I feel like that particular change of the show is more of like shock value because they repeated. Especially because like they like stab the her belly, yeah. and the, you're like, oh my god, okay. <laughs> I think that that was that main change, but also it's like they weren't going to do anything with that character after that, so they just killed her. Yeah. Um, 
Ryan says, I don't miss Rob's character as I read the rest of the books. I just never got attached to him like I did other characters. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't think I was really attached to, right? to him just because, like, I TV. saw Game of Thrones the first season yeah. before I read all of the books. And so, like, Richard Madden in my head the whole time. And I was like, no, yeah. not Richard. It's hard to get attached to some of the characters in the books simply because they aren't POV. So, like, you don't yeah. get a lot of interaction with Rob well, at all. That's how I accidentally spoiled myself with the Red Wedding because I was, like, reading Game of Thrones after having seen the first season and then, like, reading all the books. And I was like, why isn't Rob a POV character? And then I was like, oh, oh. Oops. <laughs> well then. Uh, so Noel, I think I think uh, Catelyn hates John because John is supposedly a bastard. I th I think that's yeah, just more so it's being made of cool there. Um, but I would be interested to see um, if there is any foreshadowing for Rob being Brandon's. I mean, I, I don't I, I I don't know. If, if that if were to be the case, it goes nowhere because Rob is dead. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think it goes anywhere, even if it's true, right? Um, yeah, Rob is one of those characters like a Clash of Kings. You know, it's the thing about Rob that I miss is the fact that he was going to make John his heir. And mm -hmm. I would have really liked to see a reunion between Rob and John. Not but, even a reunion because, like, it. to be someone's heir, like, you have to have died in order well, for yeah. to come into play. But, like, yeah. For them to reunite and have that conversation, though. Yeah, I think that would have been legitimized really him a little bit. Which Somebody then, I mean, Janice wants to make him Rob's heir, too. <laughs> he just wants to make him Lord. Everybody wants to make John the heir. Stannis is straight up just like, I'm just going to give you Winterfell. I'll, I'll knight it's you It's funny right that, like, now. both Rob and Stannis independently want to give John Winterfell. Everybody wants John to lead, and he doesn't want it. That's why he's the best leader. I don't want it. She's my queen. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what about the change to, like, the, the book? They say Jamie Lannister sends his regards, and the show just says the Lannisters send their regards. So are they just like writing it off as like Jamie didn't have anything to do with it? Yeah, well, I don't think Jamie did. Yeah, Jamie didn't. Well, oh, I know, but like in the book specifically, he says Jamie Lannister sends his regards before he stabs Rob. Yeah, I think it's probably in the idea that they kept him ha uh, hostage, and I'm sure they're blaming yeah. them for yeah. the hand missing. Um, but I don't think Jamie, you know, I, I, I'm sure it was just a saying because I, I don't feel like Jamie had really any hand in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, before the Red Wedding. Well, especially all... because like uh, Tywin and Jamie have a falling out and he's already telling mm -hmm. nobody about this plan. He's there's no way he's telling Jamie that. Yeah. Plan. Yeah. And honestly, I think Tyrion's pretty upset. You know, and, but then they say, "What's the difference between killing a man at the dinner table at an open field?" Like, what's rules the are deal? rules. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not that different from like if you, you know, have a parlay. Like, you're supposed to like this is supposed to be a moment where you can discuss terms. You know, like yeah. for surrender or something. And if you just mm -hmm. like up and kill somebody during parlay, you're like that means that forevermore you don't have the opportunity to do that because we've agreed that this isn't a rule anymore. And that hurts yeah. everybody, including <laughs> your side. Yeah. Well, just like when Joffrey in you know book one cut off Ned's head, he was like, "There goes your peace." Like your piece died when Ned's head <laughs> got cut off. It's like you said one thing and then you decapitated him. It's like, yeah, you brought them into your home for a wedding feast and then murdered everybody. Like, yeah, and it did seem like uh, that it was Frey's doing, like Frey's the oh, one yeah. that pulled the trigger. It, it was obviously set up by the Lannisters, but mm -hmm. I think in a conversation with Jamie, uh, we hear Tywin actually say that was all on. That was Frey doing Frey things. Well, I mean, I, you just really get the sense that, like, Tywin is like, well, we would never do anything so low. Yeah, but, like, if it. they'll do it for us, I mean, yeah. more power to you. And we'll yeah. cut you loose because we don't Tywin, need you either. Because Tywin's strategic, though. And he's methodical. He's just like, yeah, they removed a, a problem for us. So now we're stronger. He's like, I don't care. It's fine. And we're not officially to blame for it in any way. It's that. Yeah. Oh, while Jimmy has dinner with Roos before leaving Harrenhal, he literally says to send the Starks my regards. Yeah. But with zero. Oh, very cool. Very cool. I missed that. Good catch, Derry. Um, Catelyn spends a lot of time with her father before the Red Wedding mm -hmm. happens, and we hear ho uh, Hoster. Is it Huster or Hosters? I always said Hoster. It could okay, be Hoster. So Whatever. Go with Hosters. I say Hoster. All right, I'll switch between them then to balance it Just out. Just like Roy. Um, but he he has. The, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> uh, he has these dreams. And he's talking about Tansy, mm -hmm. Tansy, Tansy. I missed this on all my other rereads, but. I thought that it was a person. I'm trying to figure out, oh, who's this Tansy Tansy? Who could it be? Who could it be? I haven't had a big thing. Cat yeah, was like, who is this? Yeah, and I'm like, who is this? But then in a Samwell chapter, it gives it away. Because Samwell has Tansy in his bag yep. as a medicine that can also be used for an abortion. Mm -hmm. And we get it confirmed at the end of the book that 
basically that's why Liza doesn't talk to her dad anymore because she was pregnant. And uh, probably with... why she struggled to give John Aaron children. Correct. Yep. Yes. So this uh, Derry was in my discord who's in the chat now and she had this from the get go. She's like, oh, I actually know what Tansy is. And I'm like, wait, what? It's real. And it is. And this is the thing. So yeah. that is something that I missed. Can totally. we also just like briefly talk about how like on point and disgusting the choice is to like let us know that Liza smells like milk. Oh, oh God. <laughs> like, mm, there's like lots of perfume and powder, but beneath the perfume and powder is like <sighs> milk. And you're like, <laughs> Liza is disgusting. Oh, no. Like straight up. Liza is It's is... just like, I mean, a lot of things about her. Like you wouldn't have had to put that in and we'd still be pretty grossed out by her, but just that. So the whole rest of the time you're just like, I'm just think picturing smelling milk. Yeah. Yeah. I mean you get that, you get a nice sex scene with Peter, you get some like But then you think of the kisses. sex scene. And how he would have been smelling milk the whole time. <laughs> it's more gross now. Are oh, you not into that? No. Uh, <laughs> I do think Liza is kind of a tragic character, though. I mean, she clearly makes a lot yeah. of decisions that are that are terrible. But yeah, I mean, I feel like she had so much trauma, and for sure, Peter. But it sounds like she was cat. pretty nuts when they were young too, and obsessed with him, and like mm -hmm. the way that she threw herself at him and was like, "No, it's me you love." And like even when it was clear that he was into Catelyn, like yeah. he was not trying to pull the wool over her eyes when they were kids. Like he was clearly oh. into Catelyn, and even then she was like, "Me, it's me, it's me." And you're like, "Lady, it's not you." <laughs> yeah, I I mean I think everyone has like a a uh, infatuation in their in their younger years, but imagine yeah but think about having that person you know that person gets you pregnant and then you're forced to abort it and then he no longer really wants you and you think he wants your sister like she kind of got back. stuck i feel like she got stuck with it he comes back and he's just like i've only ever loved one person cat, cat. cat. <laughs> goodbye but also i mean like so it's obviously in what the moment scene. like he you know she's threatening sansa and like being crazy oh, he goes but, like it's very clear that like the reason peter is killing her is because like she has held his secret for a very long time mm -hmm. about what happened with john aaron yep. and you know, like she's clearly a loose cannon and like even if he yeah. didn't kill her right then he was clearly going to kill her because it's too dangerous that she knows this mm -hmm. i like what Derry said here there's a possibility that liza got pregnant to peter on more than one occasion even when he was so drunk, he genuinely thought she was cat. Yeah, I think I think Peter actually believes he did take Cat's maiden's hood, but it was actually Liza. I think he was that drunk. I think that that's possible. Could be. Because you don't he, think Rob is act is actually secretly Peter's child? Could you imagine? Ew. Ew. Could you imagine? That just feels dirty. Now, do you think little Rob, like still breastfeeding at like thirty, Rob? Do you think he is Peter's? No. You don't think? I don't. I, I'm not sure. I was just wondering. Um, Either way, I feel like Liza would have made a point to say something about it if she believed there was any possibility that that was true. Yeah, especially Probably. once er, once John was gone, I would say. Yeah, but as soon as they got reunited, she'd be like, "And it's our son." I wanted to tell you, but I couldn't. Like, even mm -hmm. if like she couldn't be certain if there was any overlap of them like sleeping together where it could be true, she you know she would be all in on that's what this is. <laughs> he just would have sent both of them through the moon door. Simultaneously, yeah, he gave him the Sparta boot. Like, oh, family hug. <laughs> Just <kidding. laughs> I wish he would have thrown little sweet Rob out the door. <laughs> Kids annoying as shit. Yeah, he oh, he's also gross. Yeah, oh, he's disgusting. And and you know he's smashing a Winterfell snow castle. That sends a. It's the only thing she's done for joy in three years. And this little shithead. It takes a stupid doll, man. Even if she does things for joy every single day, it is a needless. It's a very Joffrey thing to do to just wreck something. Yes, yes, it is, and we, and we don't need any more evil children making bad decisions for the realm. I mean, children that are coddled by their psycho mothers mm -hmm. until they're way too old for it, and they're acting all violently. Like, it's fine. Just let them run a kingdom. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? He's What's he's next in line. Happen? He's next in line. Just throw people down out the moon door. Oh my Make God. them fly, mommy. Ugh, it's burned into my brain. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, let's talk about Jamie. Let's talk yeah. about Jamie because Jamie is Jamie's so chapters. good. And as I've already started a feast, oh my God, his chapters are so good. It's ridiculous. He's the only thing that kept me going through feast for gross. I was like, well, at least I have Jamie. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I won't I, I won't argue that I think they're the best because they are, in my opinion. Um. 
I love that in the Clash of Kings, Jamie's life's left in danger, but we start with his POV to start the book. So again, if you had not known, of course you yeah. probably think he's alive, but Catelyn swings the sword and it goes to black. Yeah. Um, no body, like Leanna said, uh, you can't trust it. But that's kind of cool. The first POV of the book being Sends that him on his merry way. Yeah, and did you guys feel like he's infatuated with Brienne's ugliness and I mean, her eyes? But it almost feels like he's trying to like convince himself he's not attracted to her. And so, of course, I, I 100% get that because there's even points in the in the book where he's like, maybe she is kind of hot, but she kind of looks like a dude. Like, <laughs> there's I that don't feel like. I mean, I feel like it starts out not as him finding her attractive, just as like it's inconvenient for him to have feelings or emotions about anybody because like hats yeah, out his sure. armor is to not care about anyone. I mean, that's front and so like the person he's with, like when you first start his POV, like, yeah. you haven't really been in his head for him being around other people. And then I feel like that would be his coping mechanism at all times with Definitely. all people you're, like finding flaws, picking you apart in your mind, just being like, you're the worst, you're ugly, you're dumb, making fun of you in my head. You have no power over me. Because, like, yeah. he knows when people talk shit about him. And so yeah. he just, like, talks shit about people in his head. So I just feel like he meets Brienne. Yep, talking shit about her. Because I talk shit about everybody in my head. Because that's how I deal. I think definitely up front, that's for, for sure what he was doing. But also, it's like, he's probably trying to get her to let him go. Like, he's doing anything to just, like, maybe if I piss her off enough, she'll let me go. He'll rile her up he's, and make her stupid. Or fight. Yeah, Plus, I mean, he like, doesn't he's take he's seriously killer. that she'd actually be good at fighting until he's actually, if that's proved to him. And then he's like, mm -hmm. holy shit, you're, am I losing? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Yeah, and also it's like, isn't it weird that, I don't know about you all, but I kind of didn't like Brienne when she was being mean to Jamie, even though I shouldn't have cared. I was oh, like, hey, Jamie. leave him alone. Poor Jamie. <laughs> leave him alone, Brienne. Quit being a bully. We call him the, the Kingslayer. I'm over Well, it's it. just, I mean, it's hard to, uh, I mean, I obviously like Jamie, but like, even if you don't, like, she is kind of like that painfully naive person that's similar to Sansa, except she's older than Sansa and has seen mm -hmm. more of the world than Sansa. And you just kind of want to like shake her and be like, do you really think the world works like that? And like yeah. when Jamie's pointing that stuff out to her and being like, do you really think that's how this works? Like you can't help but be like, I mean, he's right. Like, do you think that's how this works? Because <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> I mean, yeah, to Noelle's point, uh, everybody in the show is way more attractive than their book counterparts for the most part. So yeah, going well, I to think it's also like definitely... It's Way a really different. It's a really different dynamic between them, also because uh, not just because all the actors were older because they were, mm -hmm. but like Brienne is a lot younger even than Jamie in the book. Like she's quite yeah. young, and so I feel like yeah. in the show, like that she was around the same age or older than Jamie. There's just a very different dynamic between them because there's this level like to Brienne where yeah, she's physically strong. She's definitely a threat to him, like which he wasn't expecting physically. And she's not very pretty, but she's very young. And like, it is believable in a Sansa ish way that she is quite naive and quite doesn't actually get how the world. She's still like, her mind of like what a knight should be is like sure. the same thing Sansa would say. But that, even, like, but this is you do the noble thing, you say though. true, you defend the weak. Like, that's what being a knight is. That's what she believes. Yeah. And you're like, are you Ned Stark? Did. Well, you and know he what? Died for the same reason. Like, Ned Stark was the same way. Like, he believed to his beheading that the world worked a certain way until he was literally proven by but brienne was already world. around like she already heard that ned got killed she was around renly and saw him sure. killed like she's been around some stuff where you're like well i mean i think that also the reason why she resents jamie so much is because she says he is a kingslayer they're calling mm -hmm. me kingslayer now oh sure. i didn't kill renly yeah and i think she sees they're kind both of misunderstood in similar ways huh yeah, and she's the oath keeper and he's the oath breaker. And it's like one of the most poetic things in the series. Again, this is something I would argue against nihilism, no matter what ends up being the outcome, even if it was a. Well, I mean, I love when Jamie tells her to go after Sansa and he's like, and she's like, why would you help? And he's like, we Kingslayers should stick together. Yeah. <laughs> and then Let's she gets go. mad. Let's go. It's so good. Um, and he, I also wanted to say that I really liked the boat scene where she goes up and pushes the rocks off and stuff. Like, yeah. I thought George did a really good job with that scene. And Jamie's like, why would you do that? She's like, because I have, I took a note. Like, I got to get you there. He's just like. And he holds out the oar for you. Stupid. Because he could have hit her with the oar. That could have been yeah. a wrap. Because yeah. he had his dude in, in, in the canoe, right? Um, but I thought it was like really well written too. Like I don't really oh, yeah. like boat shit at all. But I read Fever Dream. Says the live ship fan. I know. Well, hey, my biases are always being challenged. That's for sure. It's only when Hob and George R. R. Martin do it. I did love Fever Dream, which takes place on a steamboat. Tremendous, tremendous book. Vampires. You should, everyone should read. If you like Salem's Lot, it's better. Yeah. In my opinion. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean with with Jamie and Brienne, we get the brave companions. You get Vargo Hose. You get 
Zolo cutting off his hand. Yeah. That that was also a great scene in the show. Uh, I remember yeah, whenever yeah. like they chop it off at the end of the episode, and I just look over. My wife's like, "Uh huh." I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> they did <Yeah>. it. <laughs> they did it." Um, also, Jamie has a dream. Uh, mm -hmm. It says, "In his dreams, the dead came burning, gowned in swirling green flames. Jamie danced around them with a golden sword, but for everyone he struck down, another rose and, and took its place, foreshadowing for the long night in King's Landing. Maybe I, I don't know." What do What's you the green fire though? Are they going to use more wildfire? Uh, wildfire? Is wildfire? Also, I mean, if you have an army of frozen dead, I guess it stands to re reason that Relor yeah. sends an army of burning dead. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, Song I, of ice and fire, yo! <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the book that Sam's writing? Oh, 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 oh. that's what I'm writing. Uh, <laughs> no, you're not, you piece of shit. <laughs> I but this is one of those ones where I can't put my finger on what that means. Is it just purely symbolic of him being swallowed by his duties as a king's guard or something? I don't know. Well, I think the reason I mean I good writing is when it works on multiple levels. Because like, yeah. if you read that and you were like, yeah. Well, that's clearly a vision of this, or if you read it and were like, Well, that's just their personal thing, and there's like no inkling of that being a vision of anything like it's the fact that it works on multiple levels and it might just be personal shit that resembles something that could happen, or like it might be more like the fact that you ask those questions instead of it just being like, What's well, that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so what Noel was talking about, like, is that confirmed a thing yet, though? And I, at least not as, as of this book. I don't remember if that's in the books yet or not. It's not. It's uh, not confirmed, but it does seem like that that it, there is a justification for there being fire whites for sure. But like, were the fire whites? Is that just like a fan thing that that the fandom has created as like a term, though? I was gonna say I don't think they'd be called that. Yeah, okay. they might not be called that, but the idea that. That there is the good people like walking zombies essentially. That yeah, there, there is an opposite good. to the to the cold. Yeah, um, which I think I think I, I mean obviously we've seen uh, Beric Dondarrion come back. We've seen Lady Stoneheart. So we've seen what Melisandre some, can do. Yeah, there's something yeah. going on there for sure. Um, I, I mean I don't know. This gives me hope that in the book Melisandre should be dead multiple times over. Yeah, that's true too. It gives me hope that maybe the long night will happen in Westeros or uh, Westeros, of course, but um, um, King's Landing. Because I, I, I really hope it does. I, I hope, hope that vision good. of a ruined King's Landing with snow is not the stupid shit that the show did, and that it's actually like the the White Walkers get to King's Landing. Like I need a battle there. I need whatever the Great Other is like sitting on the throne, kind of shit. Like I Winter want is coming. Oh shit! So they are called that. Gurm called Barrack a fire white when he Did spoke he? Ashaya from a history of Westeros. There wouldn't be that many of them then, right? Right now, but yeah, but they're starting to build. They're starting to come back. Yeah, the Lady Stoneheart scene, best epilogue ever. Yeah, it's oh, pretty rad epilogue. So good. The thing about George is that he's phenomenal at writing horror. He's so good at it, and the way he mixes it in here, I love it. As a as a horror fan, it's 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 definitely oh, up for sure. Alley. Man, that Jamie. Dream. Are you a fan of George R. R. Martin? You know, I, I've I've got a couple of his books. Uh, I might. When you say the thing about, I was like, oh, there's only one thing. <laughs> I never talk about George except these streams. It's the only time I get the. Because we can guys. see it, it goes quite far when you decide. To... I know. <laughs> I know. To go full song of fire. Yeah. Keep going. I'll be right back. Do I have to wear this every stream now? No, I said take it off. It's itchy and I, you didn't even have to wear it for this stream. Trying to drink is very difficult. And straws. Straws are your friend. <sighs> oh God, it's in my mouth. Ugh. All right. You um, can take it off. <laughs> so so you know, it'd be pretty pretty great if Alex left and then you came back and the beard was gone. Yeah, you're actually not wrong. I don't know, see chat. If he notices. Chat, should I take off the beard? But see if Alex notices. Don't say anything. He'll definitely say, so you took it, you took it off. Did this conductor, this conductor hat, though? And it's then pretty, you can say that you, know. you never wore a beard, that he was imagining it. Oh, people are saying to take it off. All right, I guess I will. A couple books, a couple. All right, let me take this off here. Ugh. Jimmy, nice of you to join us. Oh, my God, you look like you belong in, like, the, A kid show. No, what's that Broadway show um, <laughs> about the, the newsboys or something? <laughs> what's it called? <laughs> Emily said, take it off. Apparently, if, if it's uncomfortable. I feel like people, I made other people uncomfortable. Newsies, is that a play? Newsboys. Mr. Okay, Panther that's says. That's what you look like. You should, yeah. Start hey, what's singing, up, Mr. Please. Panther? I haven't seen you in a long time, man. What's up? Good to see you. 
Or I uh, see it is oh, newsies. 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 So yeah, we agree. <laughs> no, so, nah, I loved it. Um, yeah, but it, the, the reason why I get so excited about these and do this is because I try not to talk about George too much on the channel because I know what it's going to be like. But I feel like these are where I, get I don't to go. try not to talk about Abercrombie. I don't know why you're doing this to yourself. Mainly it's because um, you don't have to do it with the unfortunate uh, barrage of comments every time you mention his name of he's never going to write the next book. He's taking so you think I picked a better author to be a fan of. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> or you picked one that writes enough to apparently keep everyone's interest. You know, even I mean, I, I do deeply appreciate that he writes his trilogies all in one go and then publishes them. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, over oh, Jules says Bran at the night fort was is a, such a great horror chapter. Yes. Bran is is mostly obviously Lady Stoneheart now introduces uh, a whole different angle. But Bran is such a gateway to combining the fact that this is going to have time travel. This is going to have horror. And George is a very big fan of both of those things. He loves science fiction as well. Uh, he says that they uh, fantasy, horror and sci fi all live in the same house. They're in different rooms, but they're all along the same houses and I th are in the same house. And I think that that's a really good way to put it. Would love more Gurm. Well, maybe I'll do like my nephew notes. wants to be a train conductor when he grows up. <laughs> Yours? <laughs> Terry said you look like a nephew wants to be a train conductor <sighs> when he grows up. <laughs> I mean, it's not wrong. I got it. I got it. Uh, can we mention the story? Um, not, yeah, yeah, we can. I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll go ahead and talk about brands since we're doing this. The Night of the Laughing Tree story with uh, Mira and. Um, uh, and I'm already forgetting his name. There's Jojen? Two. Yeah, Jojen. Sorry, there's hair all over this thing. It's gross. I can't imagine why. I don't know either. I shaved. Uh, yeah, so Night of the Laughing Tree is awesome, but I also just love the reeds. Like, I'm all in on the reeds. Howland Reed is one of the biggest um, kind of, uh, what, what's, the, what's the term I'm looking for? Ace in the hole, I guess, uh, for George to get a lot of stuff done as far as like what the mysteries were and how they're going to be revealed. And then I had a laughing tree is definitely Liana. It's definitely Liana Stark. In my opinion. There's an all caps agreement with you in the chat. Yeah. We're saying uh, the night of the laughing tree. We started just started talking about brand. Um, and we were talking about the reeds talking about the night of the laughing tree. And I feel it was I, I, Liana's story is pretty great. I mean, unfortunately she's dead, but. I, th I think it's pretty clearly honest the night of the laughing tree. And it also is very um, consistent with the fact that Arya is supposedly a lot like Liana. And mm -hmm. it also connects the fact that John and Arya are mentioned about looking alike constantly. Yep. Uh, and that Arya looked like Liana. So it's, it's all there. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. The, and the reads are so interesting. They are too bad. That was one of the forgotten plot lines. Oh, someone said, has anyone read it? Yeah, uh, Gurm Sci-Fi is excellent, and Fever Dream is also excellent. Uh, did we ever finish up talking about Jamie? Uh, Yeah, we talked about the dream. I'm trying to think of anything else. Obviously, he gets back. Well, gets I mean, we didn't talk at all about like his slow realization about what Cersei is really like. The fact that she tells him straight out, of course, I lie to you. Everybody lies to you. And he's mm -hmm. like, what? Yep. <laughs> or and Tyrion. Brienne from a bear. God, that does happen in this book too, doesn't it? He just does it all. Yeah. And he saves Tyrion at the end. And one of the Tyrion most out? Oh my God. Tyrion yeah, we lies. Tyrion we we can save that spot for Tyrion. I was saving Tyrion for last because yeah. I feel like that's yeah. like the home run. That's the mic um, drop moment. But yeah, you're right. Cersei does straight up say everyone's lying to you, and he already has in his head that you know he doesn't know what she's been doing while while uh, he's yeah. been gone. And the King's Guard's totally changed, and he's he reading the white Lancel. Oh, but he always gosh. thought in his mind, every the whole world can go to shit. They're all liars. They're I all awful. But Cersei and me, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. we're like, and she's like, of course I lie to you. And he's like, yeah, of course she's she does, up. dummy. She's just like, you're stupid. She's like, how are you this dumb? <laughs> like, man, she's 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 worst. cold. Was it in this book? And who was it that said it? That like Cersei thinks that she should be in charge, but the problem is that she would doesn't even know what to do with power when she has it. Is Probably it Tyrion. No, I feel like it was like Varys or Peter that said that. I think it is Tyrion. Is probably is Peter. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably Littlefinger if it wasn't Tyrion. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is Peter because I think uh, Sansa says something along the lines yeah, of yeah, like, yeah. but the queen, the queen. And he's like, the queen, get out of here. 
What, what was that? Did he throw up in his mouth? Yeah, but <laughs> he makes me throw up in my mouth. Gotcha. Um, yeah, Jamie also looking at the uh, the the what, good white book, you know, and looking at all the other knights and seeing that his page can is still to be written. It's one of the more on the nose things. Yeah, I think that George writes because generally he tries to get away or get his way around to a point to get you to realize what's happening. But for that, right on the nose, like okay, Jamie's about to start writing a new history, and yeah. then what does he do? He saves his brother. While then Tyrion makes a decision in those last moments that then send him on a different trajectory. It's so, oh, I love that parallel. It's like the much. same path that they take in the show, but with like totally different context. Mm -hmm. Well, in the context lie. Context is important. It the is. lie is everything. Oh, yeah. The lie is the key to Tyrion's future arc. Well, just like and, I mean, just, I mean, straight up just book, book to show adaptation for Tyrion as a character. He's too likable that they didn't want to make you also hate him. Which is why, like, yeah. which is funny cool. because by the end we did hate him because suddenly he became stupid. But that was which just bad like, writing. Hate that <laughs> made him dumb. But like the book, you can clearly see he is much more of a bastard. Than... Which is like better to be a bastard than to be dumb. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we, we can get around. We can get uh, by with cunning trash bags, but boring trash bags or dumb trash bags. It's like yeah. I will. I love that. Like that interview with Peter Dinklage from like the when they were doing all the like the last episodes you know and like the cast was like commenting on it as it went and Peter Dinklage was like so he puts them all in the crypt so guess he's not that smart after all <laughs> you're like no you can see how much he's like mm, mm -hmm. so dumb <laughs> what's annoying now though is now he's I don't know if like HBO told them to stop talking shit about the show because now he's out there saying that like everyone's just mad about the ending of the show because all the white people didn't set like right off into the sunset or some shit and everyone's just like no bro like that's not even though that is what literally kind of happened because every white character gets like a, a happy ending basically but like that's but all the dothraki came back to life that's a happy ending for right? them and the unsullied i'm not gonna hold anything at peter dinklage speaking highly of the people who made him a millionaire oh of course because if uh you know someone buttered my bread i'd be like yeah that's fine Especially every time i watch L, I'm like, oh yeah he's in this yeah <laughs> Yeah, he's a bastard in that. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, uh, I guess we can continue talking about Bran. Uh, what did you guys think about Bran warging into Hodor? That's, I mean, very sick. unsettling. Very I mean, uncomfortable. It shows you that you're not just warging into animals because until that. I mean, point... it's like you're gonna. It's a natural question that people would ask, and like mm -hmm. if this was like you know a normal fantasy book, you're like, well, then why don't they work into people? And George R. R. Martin's like, yeah, well, they can. <laughs> and, it, and it's kind of considered to be i think jojen actually says like that is like a sin oh, against no. everything oh yeah well it's also that's described it's too as like when he's like trying to grab it it's like pulling away at the same time as he's trying to grab it it's like how brand describes the sensation of like trying to warg into hodor that it's like yeah. there is resistance and that's what like gives you the impression that like yeah there's resistance so you know means no stop <laughs> so yeah. do, we buy, do we buy into what the show did as far as like not necessarily like the hold the door moment, but the fact that he's the reason that Hodor is like. Yep. I think that's that's some time. that part of it is like so bizarre and timey wimey and like yeah. that's got to be a George R. R. Martin thing. I think in the There's tell no all way book, those chuckleheads thought of that. Yeah, I think in the tell all book they actually say that was one of the. There's a certain amount of moments, which I figure we'll go with when we do like the very last stream. We can talk about that. Yeah. We can kind of postulate about like what's going to happen, but that was that was one of them. Um, what does this say about Brand though? That he's dumb. Well, he's a kid. He kind of to just do shit. Yeah, but it just makes me wonder, like, is he all good? No. None, no one is all good, sir? Well, Have you I been know. reading these I, books? No, I, I, I totally know. like the theory that he's actually going to be evil, but I, at this point, he's just so young and he doesn't know what he can do. So I think he's just, like, trying shit. But I feel like if, I think there's, in general, a commentary going on in, like, how young you start being exposed to things and who that turns you into. Because like if you get handed unlimited power, be it magical or like kingly or power or money or whatever it is, like at a young age with no limits and people egging you on, like be it, you know, uh, was this Joffrey or Bran or Rob, uh, Robert, you know, little, little, little yeah, Rob, Rob, like anybody who's like handed enormous amounts of influence power. of any kind yeah. at a young age, it's going to fuck with you. Oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, it's like the movie Blank Check. Do y'all remember that movie? Nope, nope. I knew. I'm old. Okay. You're, how old are you? 31. Well, he had a big white oh, wow. beard. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Look up the movie Blank Check. Great movie. It was on Disney. 
Um, oh, is it good? It. But but to this point though, uh, I would say Brand's been very sympathetic, and Brand's been a good guy. Like he's a he's a hero in the story, or a baby face. I mean, he hasn't really done anything that's like good. He just hasn't done anything bad. Like what's I, he done that's so good? Oh, it's that movie. I know. <laughs> you, you looked it up. It's a great movie, actually. Um, well, I mean, it was good in the terms of like he helped. Well, he doesn't really help anyone. He's really he doesn't really do anyone. anything except follow rules and say like, okay, I'll do what my teacher said to do. Yeah, but he's a kid also. So I mean, I guess you what know, I'm trying to like, say it's is, it's not though, like he's going out of his way to do anything where you're like, well, what a good kid. He's just, just that's a kid. So old guys. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, I. I I should say he's a child, so we're like we're rooting for him, right? And and um, did you root for Joffrey? He's a child. I know that, but, but they're with, not. With Brand though, the the good thing about Brand is we're getting a lot of magical elements because you have the reeds with him, you have Jojen telling him all about like green seers. They tell him about the night, night of the laughing tree. Like you're, he's exposing you to this entire like magical aspect of a song of ice and fire that you're not getting, like Anywhere to the extent else. that we're getting with the other POVs. Except yeah. for Danny, because she has actual dragons. Like that's pretty magical. That's pretty magical. But, like, but it's a different piece of the magic. You're getting like the weird, like history magic of the world. Well, you yeah. get the northern half of it. Like she's covering yeah. the fire, and he's got you on the ice. Yeah, and the reeds are definitely filling out a lot of the of the blank spaces around that with like green seers and everything. I mean, they're just like dreams. walking exposition. I love it though. So awesome. <laughs> so awesome. Uh, and I, I Helen Reed is when people talk about the show, everyone has something to complain about that's in the show. The thing that I was mad that never was in the show was was Helen Reed present day. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a huge mistake. And uh, he'll clearly he'll clearly play a role. He's alive. So he's definitely going to show up at some point in the books. Um, I but mean, I, summer, so, Brand works in the summer and helps save John from the wildlings. We lost Leanna for a second. It's pretty she, important. I think she's be, turned her camera off. Yeah, she'll but... be back. Um, what about yeah, Brand's flashback? Pretty. What'd you say? I was saying it's pretty. He works into summer. And yeah. Like, Save John. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that's true. I actually forgot about that as well. So there's a there's a, something he did, Leanna, that was good. He saved John. There. He saved his own brother. He used well, it Lannister for good and too. bad in this book. I, I just think it's interesting because uh, maybe Bran with all this power is not going to be great. And if you remember, and again, this is I don't think he's going to be. I think it's going to corrupt him. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I don't it's not like he's done anything where you're like, wow, he's going to be so good and turned so evil. Like he hasn't done anything that's like that good. Well, also, we don't know if Blood Raven's intentions are good anyways. I don't think they are. No. Dudes get I mean, we know Blood Raven from Night of the Seven Kings. Like, who we do that. we know we'll in this whole universe that has TV. good intentions? Ned. Davos. Davos is the shining beacon. Davos is awesome. Maybe, maybe I'll give you Davos. Melisandre, Samwell, Samwell, Davos. I would say but, Brienne is also rather good. She can be naive, though. I was gonna say, like, a lot of it does come down though to like just some ideal of like what is to be noble or like what they how they want to see themselves. Like Brienne is a lot of that. It's just like, oh, this is what it means to be a knight, and she's been shit on because she doesn't fit the normal role society would give her. So. She's not like, I mean, she's a do-gooder, but it very much comes off as like, because like she's got it in her head that that's what you do. Not that it's this like innate goodness. Yeah. Davos is the goat. Sure is. Love Davos. Yeah. We're going to talk about him too. Um, the Onion Knight. Brand's flashback to Nan's story that explains the Night's King, not the Night King, but the Night's King uh, is really Slight cool because, that. yeah, she says that perhaps his name was Brandon Stark. And there's this whole theory that every brand or Brandon Stark is, is brand. Um, so it, it's interesting. And brand the builder that built that's everything. Where, that's where like the wild batch of theories went off the rails. It was just like he's going to turn into like the Night King at the end of the book, and he's going to be leading the army of the dead kind of thing. Yeah, I don't. Which is more interesting than what the show did. So because the show, okay, derailing for a second. The show didn't know what to do with brand anymore, so they were just like, all right. It's because like we're, Brand's we're part of it is the long night and then Brand like, is working like, to nothing for an entire bizarrely battle. conceptual and like these writers do not know how to do like bizarrely timey wimey wibbly wobbly conceptual magic y stuff. They only know how to do like we killed a person, isn't that shocking? They're banging. Wow. Like so like something that's like as strange as what Brand's got going on, they do not Complex. know what to do with that. Because if you, so I mean, because I can imagine an adaptation of like Sun Eater just being awful. 
because of like the weird stuff that happens in those books. I'm thinking yeah. more just like visually, like how awful oh, the sure. would look. Oh, that would be terrible. But like <laughs> you know, what happened with the show running out of materials, they turned it into just like an action fantasy yeah. story. It's like big spectacle battles. Like People Fast and Furious like, Medieval Edition. Just, yeah. They kind of like took all the smart things about the first couple seasons and was just like, let's just have big battles and cool shit happen. And sex. Of course. And, and Jack. And Harrington's ass. <laughs> if that really was you kid we don't even know we'll, we'll never know let's talk about davos davos i just want to give him a hug his conversation with melisandre when he's locked up honestly that's my favorite. favorite thing though like in terms of like what melisandre and davos represent with stannis like the sort of like the devils on his shoulders Light and, and about how much more comfortable he is around davos and that is like that's not subtle like the way that he feels kind of like mask off and just like himself mm. around Davos. Whereas Melisandre is like, okay, I gotta be this like fucking prince that was promised. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's like, that is not a skin he's comfortable in, but he's like, he's sipped the Kool-Aid. So he's like, that's who I am. And that's what I gotta do. And that's what's my job. But around Davos, he's like, okay, don't make me execute you. Cause I really like you, my man. <laughs> <laughs> you tell I me mean, the real shit. <laughs> I love that Davos is constantly like, I can't be the hand. I'm just some dipshit onion trader. Like, why? I, the hand should be like noble and stuff. And yeah, he has imposter syndrome. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, hardcore. Well, I mean, and you know. obviously, like, he, uh, Davos and John and characters like that are like, the, yeah, well, you ideally, you always want a reluctant leader. You want the mm -hmm. reluctant dictator, like somebody mm -hmm. who doesn't who reluctantly accepts the mantle that is given to them because everyone agrees they should lead, not somebody who's power hungry. Yep. Yeah. I mean, his conversation with Mel is really good because like you said, it's... it's Mel. It's, it's no, just, yeah, I Mel. cannot picture anyone Mel. calling oh. that lady Mel. <laughs> Melisandre. <laughs> they're talking about like light versus dark. And then she mentions the great other for the first time. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Uh, it's and immediately my brain pictures the Night King from the show because he cannot not. I mean, naturally. <laughs> We also hear about the stone dragon too. Yeah, and she. Which I immediately picture Mushu with the great stone <laughs> <That's> right. dragon. <laughs> uh, but she also alludes to the tragedy at Summerhall having to do with dragons, and Summerhall is like one of the biggest question marks in the series as well. I would say behind prop, yeah, probably behind Heron Hall. Um, yeah. So that conversation was like aces, so good. Davos is another character I hear a lot of people say that uh, they don't like, and what? it drives me insane. Like Davos. Dude, Davos is one of the best POVs in the book, and Derry was asking in the chat, did Davos really have a religious experience while on the rock, or was it a starving man hallucinating? It's a really good question. Why can't it be both? Who knows, bro? <laughs> Who knows? I mean, realistically, since there's like documented evidence in life that you hallucinate when you're dehydrated and you're in extreme mm -hmm. heat, it's probably that, but it's also this isn't real life is it so but i mean that you hallucinate yeah. sure but what you hallucinate might a god be controlling be it vision. yeah or maybe that's the keys to unlocking said relationship with a god to be on some sort of brink it's of death. amazing how many gods yeah. require you to do something that might put you in a state of like not sound mind in order to commune with them right mm -hmm. that's kind of crazy how that how often those coincide <laughs> yeah <laughs> um I was really moved whenever he stood up to Stannis to save Edric Storm, and I don't remember caring that much, and like my last few times reading through, but this time it it like resonated with me, like he really was putting his neck out there for the boy. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's that was a awesome. Guy. And he just hands the note, and it's all because he, he learned from the power of reading. You know, George loved writing that to all my readers out there. Reading it feels like it turns rainbow. into a PBS special. Yeah. <laughs> Don't take my word. Reading Rainbow, Westeros edition. Yeah, uh, actually, this is an inch. Kappa Mike uh, says it's interesting. The religion of the Seven doesn't seem to have magical powers; only institutional. That we've actually, seen. Yeah, that's but also, right. like, I mean, where did it come from? That's because what I it is know. currently the reigning religion. Then you don't hear much about it because no one has to explain it. It's where just do accepted. all religions come from? Yeah. But I mean, like we hear about, you know, like because the the fringe religions have to justify themselves. Then you hear where they came from and mm -hmm. and who's like just deciding to like veer from the institutional path and choose this like fringe religion. So you hear about it. But the seven is just like, well, that's just that's the religion. So like it came from somewhere. Someone started it based on some experience, on some ideas. It came from something. Yeah, I also think in is it in the world of ice and fire? 
I mean, there's also a symmetry between the seven gods and the seven kingdoms. So, like, it could it be as simple as that? Oh, did, didn't the Andals the bring Earth it? Man? Maybe, probably. Yeah. I think so maybe those those gods have power where they came from and not in Westeros. Well, there's also a theory that the stranger is the faceless god or the, uh, of yeah. uh, the House of Black and White. Which is where also like comes back to like none of these religions are true. They're all equally true because they all just represent some kind of truth to be found. That's the true of the natural laws of this universe. Yeah, I don't think one thing I don't think no matter what, even if George Bush at the 10 released them all tomorrow, I don't think we'll ever get those answers. Probably not. Well, it would make the world shallow and and, yes. and feel fake it's if you just got these like concrete answers yeah that's mm -hmm. definitely not something you have to explain but it's something that you can get more information on so you can make slightly more educated guesses about yeah, yeah but you don't need to be like here is the reason yeah no yeah that, i mean that's uh, one of the things about george's it's writing that, that i think that's why he's been able to have like this large gap in people instead of I mean, some people have obviously lost interest, but there's been a lot of content to be able to make because of the mm -hmm. way he writes and keeps things very nebulous. Well, it's like how we still get new Lord of the Rings books or like new uh, uh, Middle Earth books because there's like so much lore yeah. <laughs> to like what Tolkien left behind. You're like, yeah, we can crank out some more books based off of this. It's true. <laughs> Plenty mm -hmm. of off cuts left to just like slap a pretty cover on that. <laughs> mm. Derry says, yeah, the seven came with the Andals and carved their symbols all over the veil, as mentioned by Peter when he and Sansa arrive at the Fingers. Very cool. The all all about I'm going to say is if, if an undead army breaks through the wall, just go to the veil. What the fuck are they going to do? Yeah. <laughs> For real, though. The veil, especially the way described... the floating tower. The way it's described in the oh, book. They'll starve is you out is what they'll do. Nah, we're fine. Stock up on Twinkies. Uh, let's talk about John. Let's talk about your boy, John, Leanna. Yes, John is so good. Uh, the John most important good. piece of this book is that Tormund's uh, uh, lower half, his his genitals were bitten off, uh, half off by a bear. But he's still got plenty left. Apparently. Oh. Apparently. Wow. I thought the Tormund in the show, first of all, because love it. Yeah, and now also in The Witcher. Who's he in Witcher? Season two, episode one. Oh, is that him? Uh huh. Oh, I didn't recognize him. He looks fantastic. Yeah. He's like. I mean, he lean. didn't look bad in in Game of Thrones either. No, but he's like lean. He's beardless. It's weird. That's why I didn't recognize. Him. Yeah, and are he we, does a great job. Are, are we thinking about the same person? Because there was definitely a guy that I saw that I was like, that looks exactly like Tormund. He's the Beast. Oh, never mind. The CGI there, Beast. So there is a there is a Witcher that I was like, this dude looks like. A well, for, at first Tormund. I thought it might be that, and I was like, well, that's not him. But that like guy that taunts Siri all the time. Yeah. Him. Yeah, he looks. I was like, like he kind of. Oh yeah, he does kind of look like Tormund, doesn't he? He's like his little brother. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. right. So let's talk about John. Yeah. Oh um, my god, I cannot. Wild, I mean, this is not like the most important thing, but we're like about the I book, just the amount the of the brain. Leave Kit Harrington out of your. I'm talking brain. about the book. Before you start your rant I'm about talking, Kit Harrington, I'm not. <laughs> it kind of devolved into Kit Harrington hate. Before you go, I'm off talking on about the rage I feel when he's faced with like Alistair and them, and like them accusing him wrongly and saying all this stuff that you're just like fists clenched. You're like, no, that's not true. That's wrong. You're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> like it's honestly like uh, we've talked before about how. There's undeniable like similarity between like warging and like the the wit in Hobbes books and like other things where you're like these yeah, people are friends. Yeah. But like I really almost because this is such a cynical world, I never really feel that kind of like righteous fist clenched like anger because most of the time I'm just like, yep, sucks to suck, world is shit, blah blah blah. But like I in Hobbes books, I frequently feel fist clenched like injustice has oh no, this is wrong, and we're like. The pretty much the only time I feel that way in this book was John facing Alistair and and Jano Slint and like them and oh, them saying God, how the world is and how this has got to be and who John is. I'm just like, ah! they're just yeah. the biggest pieces of shit ever. Yeah, yeah. at least Alistair Thorne is like he's a bastard, but at least he kind of like has some honor. Jano Slint is just like a monster. Yeah, and he's like the worst kind of politician that just like keeps coming back and getting reelected. <laughs> Which is why I like when Stannis shows up and he's like, so this guy. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're like, you tell them one more time for the people in the back. <laughs> this book did turn me turn me around a little bit on, on Stannis. Because I, I did tell you guys in, in our chat like while reading, I was like, you know what? Stannis has a point. He's the only one that sees 
the real threat here. Like it took yeah. a while to get there. It's I'm not saying the that it's perfect, but I mean, I definitely rather have Stannis in charge than pretty much. I mean, Rob, I guess would have been fine. He'd grow into it, but like anyone who's still alive, yeah, Stannis, yeah, he would I mean, do it, what is right. Fair, he would, you know, it, yeah, put him to in charge. To be fair, Stannis only believes this because he lost the Battle of Blackwater and didn't take King's Landing, but. He did get there, and he's just like, "Yeah, these people are idiots." Like, there's a much greater threat. Anyway, John is who we're talking about because John is is fantastic. Well, well we can also talk about Alistair Thorne a little bit more too, because if you think Alistair Thorne, I think has his, he, he is so infuriating, but he did know the Night's Watch whenever it was a little bit more prestigious, and he's there because he served the Targaryens, and it's just so ironic that John is obviously a Targaryen. I guess, but like popular? mostly he's a bully because like when oh, yeah, uh, I'm not, is it I'm not Sam's defending. or John's POV? It might be Sam, or like it, he thinks he's like okay, but like he you know he has got you know experience and reputation, but anyone who trained under him hates him because he went out of his way yeah. to be nasty and mean and a bully to anyone he trained. You're like you know what, sir, you've not made any friends with this behavior. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that he. Um... He doesn't want anyone to be successful either. Except for him. Which is weird because and like, clearly yeah, you want the wall to survive and you want the Night's Watch to be a thing. Like You shouldn't just shit on everyone you train. Big picture isn't his strong suit, which is really what you want in a leader. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Janice Slint is just an insufferable bastard that I'd love to punch in the mouth. The fact that everyone like was going to vote for him too. like. Well, he's well, got he's the most experience. Uh, you know? Like, no, no. I mean, honestly, okay. These books were written way before this, but like it low key reminded me of like political talk. Donald Trump. Well, he ran successful businesses, so he should be in charge of the government. And I'm like, same with Janice Slint. We're like, well, he was in charge of, you know, the what's it called? Like, the... Landing. Yeah. Yeah, he's getting far off of his. He title. was a gold cloak. He could do this. And then Stannis immediately talking is just like, yeah, but they're all. They're all crooks. Like, I don't trust them for a second. Has Thorne ever even seen a white? He has not. He has not. They all, like, laugh at the notion that, like, Sam killed one. But he has seen a white because the one that attacks Mormont. But Alistair wasn't there. Where was he? Wasn't he at Eastwatch by the Bay? Was he? Because, I mean, that's what um, Aemon Targaryen says, too, when he's defending John, And he's like, John like, put his life on the line to protect Mormont from... Uh, a white, okay. and he's like, whatever. They send that shit to King's Landing too. Like, yeah, be because uh, John and him have that blow up, and John's in the cell. He's like in that place, yeah. and he said uh, Mormont sent Alistair away to keep him and John separated. Ah, uh, that's right, that's right. And really, that white attacking saved John's ass in mm -hmm. a lot of ways because he was able to play hero. Yeah. Um, I guess we got to talk about John and Ygritte. Yeah. yeah. How does Roy say her name? In this book too. I think it's Ygritte. I think I just said it the way he did because it's burned in my brain. I would say Egret. Um, you say, I mean, you get, his, right. you get his meeting with Mance, right? That didn't happen at the end of uh, Clash of Kings. That was this book, right? When he actually meets Mance. Yeah, yeah. he just Mance kills the half hand at the end of Clash. Yeah. So, you know, the whole Lord of Bones nonsense because he gets captured in this book. Um, he gets to talk to Mance. They, you know, venture north to the wall. They climb it with, you know, Egret and Tormund and all them. And yeah, you get, you get the freaking battle at the wall in this book. Which yeah. is what happened in this book. And John's like, just running Do we need another around. book? There's a lot that happened in this. I'm exhausted. <laughs> so much that happened in this book. But he becomes the Lord Commander. Uh, yeah. I mean, Honestly, okay, nine. like, Feast for Crows so also, sad. like, it's poorly paced and the decision to split it is a bad idea but it's also the fact that storm of swords is so much happening that by comparison like juxtaposing the two feast for crows feels exceptionally like most boring most. and like actionless where you're like we did all of that in storm and then feast is like what? most books in the genre are hard to compare to a storm of swords i would say yeah, but Feast for Crows is like especially actionless, and to put yeah. that right after Storm, which is like nonstop crazy shit, you're like, what? It's, it's almost a soft reset in a lot of ways. It's just it like crazy. Every single POV, like fuck. major things happen in every single POV, and some of them end. Like Rob's dead, Cat's dead. We haven't talked about Joffrey yet, but like the Purple Wedding happens. Tyrion, which we haven't gotten to yet, like goes away. It's like everything has kind of like an ending. Like John kind of 
finally takes over as Lord Commander. It's like this is a clear stopping point for a lot of these POVs. Yeah, it really is. And, and you have to kind of take a breath after all this, too. Like, you can't just keep it going full tilt. I Unless you're think. Jimmy and you immediately start reading Feast for Crow. I got I was I started yeah. to. It's so good. It's actually I was so a lot proud of myself that I finished like sooner than the day of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm confusing the show with the book for Torment. That's why. Do you? Uh, well, I think. All right, actually, how do you guys feel about Egret and John and their relationship? I like it, and then I feel Fine. like it, it ended very suddenly. Yeah, I almost felt like it. I feel like they make a bigger not. deal of it in the show. Oh, they do. Yeah. Definitely. Because of Ollie. Just like they also make a bigger deal of Rob and his squeeze in the show. But Rob is also a POV in the show. Egret is definitely a vehicle for John's inner turmoil of duty yeah. and love. Yeah. I mean, it's good. It's really, really good. But I almost wish that Egret had stayed alive a little bit longer. Yeah. I mean, he Maybe. constantly talks about it because when everyone's like questioning him and breaking his oath, he's like, I never did except for her. Except mm -hmm. for that, that one thing I did. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And and he had genuine feelings for her too. Yeah. And he and he I think he thought it would all work out in the end, and it obviously doesn't. And they have so many good moments. Well, I don't think he thought it would work out, but he imagined they could both be alive at the end of it, not that they could be together. Yeah, you know what? I think he thought he could take care of her. I thought he could take I think he thought he could take care of her, like get her into the wall, send them safe to the south. Yeah, so I mean like he didn't see yeah. them being together. Like he just he didn't necessarily think that she'd be dead. Yeah. He certainly didn't want her to die. Yeah. Um, you, don't, she, you don't lose Gren in this book. You lose the blacksmith instead at the yeah. gate against the giant, which was a, a slight change. So it's <laughs> alive. Chloe says, uh, I mean, couldn't Martin come up with anything nicer for your regret say? She said, you know, nothing. Jones at least 20 times couldn't get away from me even after she died. Yeah, uh, George definitely does that a lot. He will pound a saying in over and over and over i feel like being such a big fan of these books as he is joe abercrombie kind of got that from him the like having kind of hey, a mantra an hour and 46 minutes before she mentioned oh it. i already mentioned abercrombie earlier when Did i you? wait oh, I you, that oh. Was the longest you've ever gone without no it. you were in you were away because okay. the because i know he was talking about trying not to talk about song of ice and fire on his channel i was like why i talk about abercrombie all the time i don't try to hold back <laughs> <laughs> I was sad at the death of Donald Noy. Yeah, Donald Noy is awesome. Would have been a good uh, Lord Commander, too. Yep, sure would have. Donald but Noy. Then we wouldn't get John. Yeah. It's I, Johnny. Donald might even been better. Who knows? I yeah. mean, honestly, like, as much as, like, it almost feels like it's the most that this series comes to being, like, a cliche chosen one fantasy series. When 14 year old Jon Snow becomes Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, you're like, Brand's Lord of Winterfell. Are we sure? Well, this, yeah. <laughs> Watch. That's why I get annoyed when people say that uh, this series literally exists only to um, to crap on the tropes in the fantasy genre. And um, I've no, seen that's people... what First Law exists to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think that's where the book is going to differ from the show. Unless I'm totally wrong, but like the show took that route of like John kind of got a happy ending. Like Sansa's queen in the north. Arya did her own thing. Like Bran is the king. Like Brand All of the main Brand. characters are like falling into their like leadership roles, and I feel like the book is gonna do it a little bit different than that. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> hi, Dude, Alan. Best Alan, friend. the best Ooh, sneak this really? ever. Phenomenal. I love it. Yo, Egret uh, mentions the Horn of Winter. By the way, first mention of that comes in this, and we hear that Mance yeah. has been hunting for the Horn of Winter to bring down the wall, and then. Oh, beast happens. Yeah, so I think that that is uh, pretty major, and obviously shows that George was thinking ahead with that and all the you stuff. You have to there. wonder why would someone create a horn that would destroy the wall? It's a magical horn. That actually is a good question, though. Why I don't know what the order. I why don't know the, the wall. It's like, the same so reason that when you build a Death Star, you build it so that you build a hole if that you, you can explode. Yeah, it's about. It says about Bran that Bran sucks. What, are you listening to like an hour ago? <laughs> that was like an hour ago. I don't even know what's happening. I feel like Alan is like an hour back in the street. Because I said, what does that say about Bran when he worked in the Hodor? 
And he's saying it says about Brandon the brand sucks. I think he's typing in the chat now, but listening an hour back. <laughs> Seems like an Allen thing to say. Uh, Allen thing to do. Egret says no horn. Man says yes horn. Said horn gets burned. Interesting. But I mean, I know we're definitely have, but Feast does your honest king's move claim that he has the horn. Yeah, and then there's also a horn, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, that Sam has when he goes to Old Town. And a lot of people think that the horns got flipped. Yeah. And that he, uh, Euron will attempt to do the dragon binding horn and bring down the wall inadvertently, which is a really interesting idea. And also right up, uh, right up the alley for a song of ice and fire, in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, John ends up becoming uh, the Lord Commander. It's pretty. Wait, so hold on. Are you saying they're not going to do a trip beyond the wall, and Danny's going to lose a dragon, and no. then immediately get raised as an ice dragon that's no, going to that. destroy the wall? No. They no, send is... an entire uh, White Walker down to King's Landing. Just to almost attack Cersei. Anyway, all right. <laughs> Sam has the horn. When the horn is found, John and Sam both try to blow it. No noise. The others from Whites attack first. Yeah, or the fist. I'm sorry. The dog whistle of spooky horns. I want to know more about where those tunnels go. Yeah, there's a ton of tunnels. Which ones? What tunnels are you talking about? The tunnels uh, the Egret talks about uh, oh, yeah. that go beyond the wall. There's a theory out there that, that there's dragons in the wall. Yeah, that there's an ice dragon in the wall. I've seen that. It's pretty interesting. Well, we're going to get to the main event. We're going to talk about Tyrion now. Something. We definitely not... haven't talked about everybody. We haven't talked about no. Sansa. Oh, we, yeah, did. We, did. Yeah, we did. We talked about her like incidentally. Well, you, tell me everything you want to talk about with Sansa. Let's we talked her. about her. Robin the fact that she gets tricked people. into basically being the murderer of Joffrey. We didn't even talk about the Purple Wedding. No, we haven't talked about that yet. Oh, well, yeah. That's about... also part of Tyrion, though, isn't it? But it's also part of Sansa. That's fair. <laughs> it's both. And I mean, we'll like all both. of her interactions with the Tyrells and about her going now with like we kind of again incidentally talked about peter and lavelle okay, so, but we didn't really talk about sansa so she, going has there. Whole, she has the whole conversation with elena and marjorie right about like whether or not joffrey is a good guy a swell, elena's amazing a swell lad she's amazing and she's just like oh i like him he's he's super cool don't don't worry he's he's the best and then elena's like fuck off with that tell me the truth she's like he's terrible <laughs> he's a monster <laughs> <laughs> Lady Elena is... And then she's like, this will not do. Margie's like, whatever, I'll marry his younger brother. <laughs> and they're going to send her to... Obviously, they want to send her to the High Garden, but she ends up getting married to Tyrion. Like, Morris? And they're like, what? No, you dummy. There's a um, there's a picture from her wedding in the Illustrated Edition, or maybe it was in the Folio Society one, but of like Tyrion having to have her hunched down. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And like, like put on the cloak. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah. God. <laughs> And I love how, like, she initially she's like, "No, I'm not gonna bend down." And then, like, as he's struggling, she's like, "Okay, I do feel bad about this, but it's really, the crowd like, like laughing I can't at back him. down now." <laughs> and he thinks about it afterwards. He's mm -hmm. like, "Couldn't she have just kneeled down?" And even she's like, "Ah, uh, that yeah, I probably should have. Uh, that wasn't a good look." <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So she gets married. Congratulations to her. Tyrion's all creepy and horny around her, but like also thinks that it's wrong. And yeah, I mean, the, I had forgotten, honestly, that the Purple Wedding happened in this book because Joffrey straight up dies and Sansa Joffrey gets swept away. Joffrey is the away. worst. He is the worst. He's, <laughs> He's definitely so, behind. He's behind. Like an hour. Alan is like an hour back in the conversation. Oh my God. Is it on purpose though? <laughs> Probably. Either way, it's funny. Tremendous. <laughs> yes, I mean, so we get, we get Sansa... Obviously, Sansa and Tyrion getting blamed for Joffrey's death because Cersei's just Cersei. Um, you get her, he did it. He did it. Yeah. You, get, you know, Sir Dantos, you know, getting her away and then Peter killing him. Um, because he did it. We, already, we, already talked, we already talked about the veil, like at that point when I think the only thing that we didn't really talk about is like jokingly we talked about it, but like Peter killing Lysa, but having Sansa like dye her hair black and like take it a, a bastard name. Um, what's the, the, the last name that they take on stone stone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, also the reveal that Liza is the one that killed John Aaron. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
She's like, I did dun, it for dun, you. Dun. I did it for our love. Which we all were, I think at this point, would have said, if we had read the books at the time, we'd have been like, yeah, it was definitely Cersei mm-hmm. and Jamie. 100%. Or if not Cersei and Jamie, like a Lannister. Yeah, a Lannister. Yeah, would have been the correct guess, I think. Yeah. But Chenzo yeah, so is that. Eliza. Yep, she's crazy. But also, like, it's not Liza. I mean, it is Liza, but it's Peter through Liza. But yeah, he's the one that decided this was a good idea. Things. Yeah. <laughs> I don't feel like there's that much more to talk about for uh, Sansa, though, to be real. I'm trying to think. She, she does think of the Hound quite a bit, which I think is probably an indication that they're going to meet up again. Well, it's also, I mean, like, because she still does represent the claim for Winterfell, and especially that Rob is mm-hmm. dead now. And if John is, in, you know, he's in the north. And with, excuse me, the way that um, in Dorne, you know, female succession, etc. So, like, I, I mean, Dorn, we though. do know that Peter is obsessed with Catelyn and that she looks like Catelyn. So there's obviously, like, just very personal motivations for him to be into her. But also, he's angling always. So, like, <laughs> does, does he want there. Winterfell? Well, Sansa was the uh, the heir to Winterfell, except Arya Stark is now the uh, the heir to Winterfell. It's not the real Arya Stark. Wouldn't but, it still uh, be Sansa? Well, yeah, I mean, there's the whole imposter thing, but Sansa would still be in line. Well, but she's just like, I mean, we've seen like how things have gone since then, but like at the time, what did Peter Baelish think he was getting out of getting Liza to kill John Aaron? Chaos. I mean, it is chaos as a ladder, but like specific types of chaos. Like, there's many ways chaos can go, I, and he went with that. I one. think he wanted the veil. I yeah, think he always wanted he, the veil. He's de- he's just destabilizing shit so that he can step in when the time is right. Yeah, and the veil is so powerful; has its own military force that it could rival pretty much anywhere else. But I mean, and- honestly, he's less destabilizing and more protecting the Lannisters because he had her kill the guy that was figuring out what was going on with the Lannisters and who Joffrey really is. Hold on, is so Alan he had Liza you're behind in the yeah, comments? He, he Alan, you are behind <laughs> in your comments. Okay. They're way behind in the comments. Um, yeah, but I think that he knows the Lannisters will eat themselves. So he he's Peter's okay with number one. one up. Peter's always about himself. So anything that he can do to Which is why I'm asking, the... so like what benefit did he see in himself in doing that? He was on Just the surface of it protecting the Lannisters. The All right. So, so Derry thinks that Peter killed John Aaron because his white collar crimes were about to be brought to light. Yeah, I think that could definitely be a catalyst for it. But I, I mean we I also that, think that we know that John Aaron was looking into the, the heritage of the kids, which mm-hmm. probably is just not good for most people in power anyway. So he's like, takes him out, steps in with Lysa because she's crazy to take over the veil. Cause the veil is pretty strong. Lysa just holds it to herself. So, I mean, that's, it's a power move. And then he also thought he was going to get Heron Hall and that doesn't, but he probably also made a pretty big bet on the fact that Ned would take the hand of the King spot. Mm-hmm. But I mean, he also thought that he could manipulate Ned, but Ned wasn't having it. Yeah, and I think that he he constant. I think he knew that Ned would also bury himself. Likely, like he wouldn't last in King's Landing. I think everybody knew oh, yeah. that. But Peter, I mean, Peter, Peter kind of that until he showed up and was like, "Oh, okay, so can't yeah. use you at all." <laughs> Peter, Peter is the kind of person that would manipulate anybody and everybody to get his ultimate goal, which is just he wants power. But it was also a, it was at Peter's uh, instruction that Liza wrote to Catelyn and said it was the Lannisters that did it. Yeah, destabilization. Right. It's a power move. I just feel like that whole like last that's like this, this last chapter, the second to last chapter that Sansa like is present in the room when we get all these mm-hmm. reveals. I just that whole I mean it's already like your heart's thumping because she was about to fall out the moon door, which is like mm-hmm. that holy shit, that's scary. And then yeah. these like she, Liza just starts like spewing truths. <laughs> You're like be quiet, be quiet, mm-hmm. be quiet. And like the amount of information you get out of her before she dies is like yeah what <laughs> yeah she's like ring dry like totally get everything out of her because she's gonna yeah. go out the moon like, talk, i mean like the epilogue is cool and all lady stoneheart fascinating but like it was not nearly as like holy shit as Sansa's mm-hmm. last chapter yeah those things weren't in play at the beginning i think peter <laughs> was hoping for time to hide all his borrowing from the bank well I mean, that's part of it, but you don't have them, you don't have Liza write to the Starks and say the Lannisters did it 
unless yeah, there's a reason for that. The note to cat to Catlin is a pretty big indicator that he was looking for destabilization. I mean, I'm not also saying that he isn't uh, <laughs> doing some shady stuff and doesn't want to get caught because that's definitely um, viable. <laughs> Alan, See ya, Alan. He's such a troll. <laughs> um, yeah, ba- Baelish is such a question mark going further into the series as well. Uh, I'm excited to see uh, Sansa chapters because I, I don't remember a lot from them. Even I though I've either. read them multiple times. Very cool. So now we get to talk about Tyrion. I'll, have uh, have I, we left out anybody else? I before? think we have, but it's fine. I think a lot of them will get tied into this. Before because we get to Tyrion. Like Oberyn and Cersei and Joffrey are all tied in with sure. Tyrion. I mean that's that's all I would consider that Tyrion chapters because you can't talk about Oberyn without Tyrion. Yeah. Um, and I I wrote this down. I I am always on my soapbox talking about Tyrion being a villain, but I do want to say that I think he has like a lot of really good moments in this book where he shows the kindness I, of his I heart. Wait, I also wait. We actually we legit didn't talk about Danny because we talked about Barristan and Selmy instead. No, we did. We talked about Misa and Misa and Slaver's Bay and how the bells are ringing when she burned them and how she's going to rule and. That is the 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 gist of what happened was like the gold uh, not the golden company the Dario the Dario and friends. I will say I definitely thought Ed Skrine was a way better in Dario Naharis than the the guy that got recast as him in oh, terms of, of like being accurate to the book. For sure, but I mean the the whole thing. I mean, yeah, we we did talk about da- Danny. It was just quick because it was like she gets the unsullied. She takes over Young Kai because of Dario. Okay, proves my point that Danny's boring. Okay, that's right. Move no, on. no, it's just the fact it, that her it's, moments. It's not are... a Clash of Kings, Danny, where you're getting all the prophecy and you're getting the, you know, uh, Karth and like all the weird shit that's happening. This was much, much more of her like coming into her power and gaining her army. Like she gets the Unsullied, she takes out the slavers. Dario, you know, infiltrates Yonkai and takes over, and that's. I mean, that's that's kind of like what happens in her chapter in her first love interest since uh, Drogo. Real and she it. sends Jorah away, which we talked about. Yeah, and I think the decision to send Jorah away and the way she reacts to him and all the Rhaegar lore and stuff I mean, it makes is sense, really though, interesting. Because yeah. she was like, you betrayed me. Like You literally were working for the Lannisters. And he's just like, yeah, at first I was. And she's like, when's the last time you contacted them? He's just like, oh. Um. Which like, honestly, like, I was just as, I mean, the first time you were like, I was just as shocked as Danny when he's like, well, I sent them one report, report from Karth. And you're like, that Call late into the right? game, you are still doing it. Like, yeah. are you fucking serious? Yeah, because because Barrison shows up and he's just like, "Hey, Jorah, you're you're kind of a piece of shit, aren't you?" And he's just like, "Shut up, shut up, shut up." But I mean, you really have to wonder because, like, he definitely had the hots for Danny well before then, and the fact that he was still still doing that, you're like, yeah, he was betraying her while being like, "But I've loved you, and I want mm-hmm. you," and I'm like, oh, "Okay, dude." Yeah, he's he's kind of be. Yeah, I think he's kind of gross. Just a bit, I think, but I I think that's like Dario warns her that he shouldn't have banished. She shouldn't have banished him, but I, I think that we kind of talked about everything else. Yeah, going through the sewer, um, but that's more Jora and Barristan. Yeah, which is kind of. I mean, cool. I do think it's an interesting decision for her that she either doesn't think she's ready. Or for whatever reason is like I'm I'm gonna stay here instead of yeah. like as all those times, like even before uh towards the end of Clash of Kings, when he's like, Look, just like take this shit and go to Westeros. She's like, Nope, not yet. Detour, side quest. And I now mean, we've what? done this side quest. She's like, I'm gonna stay. And you're like, well, Why aren't you going to Westeros? Yet, right? Is she in Marine yet? Yeah, she's in Marine. Yeah. Is that where this? She That's where she on? ends up. She says, "I'm going to, I'm going to rule." Is yeah. how she closes because out. she learns what happened in Astapor after she left, and she's like, "Well, that's not good." Yeah, but I think, I mean, I do think her decision to stay and rule is a combination of like learning what happened in Astapor, which she's like, "Well, fuck," but also learning about the Mad King and about her heritage as a Targaryen, and she's like, "Well, mm. I need to prove to myself." That I'm not just a mad conqueror who shows up, breaks everything, and leaves. Like I need to prove to myself that I can actually be a competent, functioning ruler. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, so Captain Mike says, where does Danny's motivation to free slaves come from? I think it comes from the fact that just her entire life she's been herded around. I was going to say that she's felt powerless and mm -hmm. owned and bought and sold. Yep. That's kind of also, I think it's just like an inherent human thing is like. But in particular, when she's like, when you've never had agency, when you've always been someone else's piece to move to like, she was sold basically like into marriage to call Drogo. Like she was a, she was chattel to be traded. So she knows yeah. what that feels like. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's where it comes from. All right, now we can talk about Tyrion. Okay, we'll allow it. <laughs> um, Tywin, uh, this, and we get this from his perspective, which I'm bringing up. But when Tywin shits on Joffrey and has him like removed, mm -hmm. it's so good. It's like Satisfying. one of the. It's one of those moments where you're like, yeah, like it's like whenever like you know your mean teachers mean to somebody else that you don't like, even when they're mean to you, you hate it, but they're like giving it the business. Well, you're Tywin like, is one of those characters that's kind of like you know like a god of the universe where you're like he's the one you're like, wait, no, but I want you to see what's going on. And when they recognize that something's going on, you feel like vindicated, like oh, the big man in charge has has recognized my grievance and has sided with me. You're like, yeah, dad says, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, yeah. Yeah, you get Tyrion coming in, and then Joffrey's just like, he's dead. Like, Rob Stark's dead. And then he's freaking out. And <laughs> I just picture Charles and just being like, the king's tired. Send his ass to bed. <laughs> like, I'm not tired. Charles Dance is literally like, I mean, all the casting was great, but he is Tywin. Mm -hmm. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Uh, we also find out that Joffrey sent the assassin to kill Bran, yeah. which is another thing we thought for sure was Cersei. Yeah, and I love the little tidbit the fact that uh, he found the cat's paw dagger in Robert's things and like Robert didn't pay attention to mm -hmm. him and it just kind of furthers the fact that they didn't have a great relationship um, which could be you know definitely a piece which of... also like we didn't talk that much about the fact that Jamie in his chapters he's like my son is dead and I like I don't care like what does that mean like who yeah. am I that I don't care about this and that he sees other people you know like when they're upset about Rob being dead and them caring more about that than he cares about you know his own son being dead and he's like I mean I never got to raise him yeah. I, he, he was, was you know, he thought kid. of Robert as his yeah. father but at the same time that feels like it's a hollow excuse and he knows it is because he's like even if that okay you can say you never really got to be a dad to him because Cersei said that you can't like realistically like the way that davos stands up for edric storm jamie should feel at least that much about his own son yeah just out of like goodness of your heart in a way but he he says this in feast and we'll talk about it then too but he says you know tell cersei you made them roberts because jamie is very much like a let's burn it down let who cares let's just say we're together like let's, well, yeah let's but also like he doesn't care at all about the the offspring of him and cersei i think it i think it's a constant reminder of the fact that they can't be public and that he it, everything has to be so difficult you know partly but i mean i feel like because we've learned that jamie kind of sees the world for what it is more than his family often does like more than cersei and more than tywin like he's pretty real about what the lannisters are like and he's like he doesn't really think of the Lannisters as this like great and noble thing he's like the Lannisters lie the Lannisters have money the Lannisters will get the Lannisters way like he's pretty real about stuff and so like I feel like he on some level saw that Joffrey was like mm, I'm not a fan of that <laughs> yeah yeah it's true I mean he doesn't even cry at his own father's funeral uh, but he uh, also remarks the fact that his dad told him that a strong man never shows tears so I think it's also kind of built into him but even then, I mean, like he shows more emotion about other things than he does about Joffrey. Yeah. Like he cares about Tyrion. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, he does care about Tyrion. I mean, that's obvious, right? So um, like he's shown that and he cares about Brienne. He gives her a, a Valyrian steel sword. He cares more about Brienne than he does about Joffrey. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a uh, interesting piece here that the child of or I'm sorry, it's uh cap on mics especially considering he insisted on attending their birth i think he grew further away from them as they uh became roberts yeah because became psycho crazy yeah because it became real right um but yeah and Derry says you know e even if it's not his son e even if you it was just a nephew you would still be upset but he just doesn't i mean everyone kind of knew joff was a monster yeah everyone except cersei yeah, and his death is so brutal in the books. Like him clawing 
marks into his face like a uh, Joffrey. Yeah, so brutal. We well, were talking about Jamie um, and how he doesn't care that Joff's dead and how he feels mm-hmm. about the fact that he doesn't care. Yeah. Oh, and, and Joff's sword's yeah. name's Widow's Whale. Pissed me off. He's had to but the fact that Jamie names the other one Oath Keeper. Yeah. Like, it's yeah. that kind of stuff from Jamie that you're like, you do have a heart and you do care about stuff. So it's very telling that you don't care about Joff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, so Tyrion, the earlier, I mean, obviously you get the, the whole, like, trial is in this, too. Which was like other than like John facing Alistair and uh, Janos, like the trial with Tyrion is the other like fist clenching like injustice <laughs> moment. Because he, he's powerless. Because you you already know the verdict before the trial begins. Well, it's just like lies that you listen to them say, and like the way that Tyrion bursts out, you're like you can't blame at all when they're like, no, you have yep. to be quiet. It's not your turn to speak, and you're like, but it's lies. <laughs> yep. T- and Tyrion's uh, speech, like I'm guilty of being a door. I mean, you couldn't write it better. It's we so epic. That scene. So, so good. So, oh my God. The trial is, uh, it's like a domino effect too. Like everything that came into play and happened also, at that point. Also, I only just realized the other day that Oberyn was played by um, Pedro Pascal. Mm-hmm. I never made that connection. He looks so different. I don't know. Like I just, when I was picturing him at how he was in the show and I was like, you know who he looks kind of like in my mind, I hadn't even Googled it, but I was just like pulling up his image in my brain. And I was like, he looks kind of like Pedro Pascal. <laughs> I was like, wait, is it Pedro Pascal? <laughs> I mean, that's just the, the, the whole build up to that. And just like his fallout with Shay and Shay just kind of like turning on him. And the and fact then, that she says my giant of Lannister in the in the trial, and then when he comes to see her and she uses it again, he's like, that's the worst thing you like, could have said right he's, now. He's like that that's literally the nail in your coffin. Yep. Like, yeah, where do we stand on Shay? I who she's, cares if she's dead. Does she ever care about him? I mean, I think she cares about him as much as he cares about any well paying customer. I don't think she cares. I I think there might have been a little bit more, but she felt betrayed and was just super petty and spiteful about it. And, but I think she was. I mean, whenever she was around Tyrion, she was like, "Well, when are you going to give me jewels? When are you going to give me kind of court?" Like she just was like, "He's a rich guy. This is my path to being kind of wealthy and well taken care of." And he didn't yeah. do it. So then she's like, "Okay, Dad wants me to to talk against him, and that's how yeah. I get my jewels." Great. Well, then that sounds better. <laughs> I don't think it was one hundred percent just a transaction, but I think it was like ninety percent a transaction. I mean I think she liked him in the bedroom better than a lot of other people who might abuse her, or whatever. Like he was yeah. fine and like he was interesting to talk to, but like I don't think it was more than a ticket to jewels and comfort. Which ultimately I mean you see how it hit you know falls out. So it uh didn't end well for her. No it did not. But, I mean the, the so the trial in it you know in itself was you know a couple chapters long. You see all these different asshole characters just dragging him through the mud and then you get that great scene of you know Oberyn saying that he'll be his champion and Oberyn very much is there to kill Tywin oh 100 percent. I mean you get all that hatred from Oberyn you get him constantly talking about how shitty King's Landing is and how bad the Lannisters are how, like we don't kill you know princesses and Dorne or whatever he said like but also the feeling of injustice that like when that duel like mm-hmm. Oberyn won he won like oh, yeah. by any like and that's what's like monologue you can't monologue george punished the fantasy monologue he did i love he it. it he says it even more times than in in the show and he's just like you raped her you murdered her you killed her children and the fact mm-hmm. that like the way he dies is like oh, the fingers being pressed into his yeah. eyes and you're just like oh oh no that's so much worse than just like being stabbed can we just yeah. stop and think about how rhaegar is the catalyst for all of this right yeah all because he read a book and he came out one day and said, I am to be a warrior. I will need trained in sword and shield. And then everything just went off the rails. Like all of this happened because See, of Rhaegar. You shouldn't read books. It's dangerous. That's the lesson to be learned. It's true. True. Ban all books. But it is Period. kind of crazy. Uh, or not crazy, but like, I just love the way that Rhaegar, like his very name, becomes just so imbued with like myth and power because of how many times he's mentioned by so many different people and about like, just sort of like the myth that was this person. And when you think about what his life actually was, like he was probably a pretty impressive young man, pretty intelligent and, you know, probably a pretty good fighter. But like who he was in real life cannot possibly measure up to the weight of his legend that it has become since he, since then. Like, And he's very melancholy. Yeah. Yeah. He was just, he was an emo, but he was, you know, a Paul Atreides. (laughs) Yeah, he he used to go to Summer Hall 
and just like sit there and and uh do jenny song and whatnot i mean that's like summer hall is the uh, almost the equivalent of like a mass disaster site right and he would just go there and write such an emo kid yeah definitely like i wrote a poem about my feelings my chemical romance (laughs) slam poetry Man, Rhaegar, you could do like a whole three hour thing just on everything that gets mentioned about him. Because remember, this is also the book where Danny starts learning about it. Like, this is kind of the book of Rhaegar. <laughs> like, it, it, it's very much a um, the fallout from something that happened 20 some years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. This God, it's so good. Captain Mike's comment. Yeah. I mean, he's totally trying to implicate Tywin because he, he says it straight up. He's like, I know the mountain did it, but who gave the order? Yep. Like, and he says those exact words like, who gave the order? Because he one hundred percent wants to call Tywin out. Oh, and and, and he wins that fight, man. He's he's got to stop talking. He just had to stop talking. He he walks right up to him and like stands over him. He's like, "Yeah, bitch." And he's just like, "Oh god, yeah, bitch." <laughs> like, you know, I think that there's like a pressure when it comes to storytelling of like, where what do you do with your story, and what's the best choice to to go? Because if you think about this, so if Oberyn kills the mountain, but somehow they still they say we're still going to execute the tier, whatever, right? Like yeah. in Oberyn, like because think about if Oberyn survives this, it's really interesting to think what would happen with Oberyn and the Lannisters in the next book, right? With him in King's Landing, but George was like, yeah. "Nope, I'm going to kill him." I mean, it would be well, it's a, because it would be like he story. doesn't. I mean, the real power in Dorne lies with Oberyn's brother, and so like mm-hmm. what having Oberyn die is so much more impactful because he's not the one that is actually the one in power. It's his brother, and his death mm-hmm. will be a catalyst, whereas mm-hmm. his life is not a catalyst for anything. I mean, it essentially, starts a civil war in Dorne. Um, but it's, it's just like so interesting that like a million things could have happened, but this is the decision that he made. It does, but like Doran's much smarter in the books, and yeah. you don't just have the Sand Snakes killing him to yeah. avenge. Doran in the books is so like, much better. It's so much everything better. in the books is better. What they ended up doing in the show made no goddamn sense. Yeah. We'll just put it that way. Yeah. Anyway, and it was also sad to me is that like both the uh, you know Pedro Pascal and also the actress Indira Varma that plays. Um, is like uh, what? Alaria Sand. Yeah, Alaria, and yeah. then the guy that plays uh, his brother. Like they're mm-hmm. all really good actors, and like I feel like the way that they made Dorn look was really beautiful. Yep. But like, oh my god, the Sand Snakes. Yeah, it just wasn't good. It's just bad pussy. Really <laughs> and Alaria is the Sphinx in the prologue of Feast. Yeah, yep. just, just saying. Mm-hmm. Uh, or what is that her name? Alaria? Am I right? Alaria. Yeah. Alaria. Yeah. Um, so I'm what about worried, the? I guess. Where do whores go? Where Where do whores go? But Taisha wasn't a whore. I mean, so sad. She was not a whore. What is she then? She She was a, really was like a, a what the Miller's daughter or whatever that ended up actually liking Tyrion and then. That means you that just can't have nice things. Yeah. Ooh. Tywin's even more of a of an just absolute gar I mean, it's not surprising that after hearing that from Jamie. Yeah. That he would then go. And let's be honest, Varys wanted Tyrion to see that. Mm-hmm. Varys could have stopped him. Yeah. You no. Know? But Varys, I think that was all part of Varys's. Well, it's plan. because like the whole time when Tyrion's like, tell me which way to go. Varys could be like, not telling you where to go because we got to go. He's like, well, don't go. But you take this many steps and then you take a left. And you're like, but don't go. And then make sure you just skip the first door. And then you're like, but don't go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, for me, it was like reading it this time. You see that there's purpose behind the way Varys is guiding him. Like okay. Varys absolutely, you know, absolutely wanted him to see Varys that. Varys creates opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yes. But I mean, even before that, too, so you get the scene with Jamie and Tyrion and a little bit different than in the show where it's all buddy buddy and they kind of leave on good terms. And Jamie, you know, at the end of that conversation is like, did you kill Joffrey? And he's just like, yeah, I did. Just out of spite. Yep. Stuck in. <laughs> it's so heart wrenching though. Cause at this point we, we we're really starting to come around to Jamie and this, and, uh, and we'll talk about it more because I think the proof for Tyrion being a villain is, is in a dance. But even yeah. then, like after Tyrion says that, Jamie still, he, Jamie, could, he's physically fit. Like he could have been like, just kidding, putting you back in your cell. And he still lets him go. But he's like, fair enough. He yeah. was well, a monster. You want to know why? Because I think he values that Tyrion told, he thinks he, that yeah. Tyrion told the truth. Yeah. Where Cersei's lied to him. Everyone's lying. The Lannisters lie. And he's saying, yeah. well, I think in his head, he's like, I asked. He gave me an answer. But the, 
the ironic thing is, is that well, we also lying. know that like Jamie feels that he should feel a kind of way about this, but Jamie also doesn't actually feel any kind of way. So like because if Tyrion had admitted to killing, I don't know, Brienne, <laughs> then you might have like been pissed. But like he already was like, why don't I care that Joff's dead? Yeah. I should be. I was like, oh, I'm real mad about this. I should be. And so he's like, Tyrion's like, yeah, I killed him. He's like, I wish I cared. I really want to care that you killed my son, but, but I just know, can't get it up. But it's like, you know, from Tyrion's perspective that he's just saying that out of yeah. spite. And then he immediately is just like, should I go back and tell him? That? Like, <laughs> I think uh... that that is going to be such a moment that's going to impact later. Like, yeah. when they see each other again, Jamie might try to kill Tyrion. Well, because, like, I mean, think about it. He just admitted to killing Joffrey. He then crossbow bolts your dad taking a shit like it's like he really did do that there's no doubt that Tyrion killed dad that that scene is so good too though and like again the adaptation i mean you have peter dinklage and charles dance delivering these lines it's fantastic but again you have that moment of him just like sitting there with a crossbow and tywin's just like what are you doing he's just he doesn't take it seriously up until the last moment and even after he's been shot he's like the fuck you (laughs) shot even before that though he's like say it again and I'm I'm gonna shoot you. He's just like, well, she's a whore. He's, like, Poof. he's just like, Poof. you little shit. Like you're no son of mine. He's just like, oh, don't don't bleed on your way out, bro. And it in fact, turns out the Tywin Lannister did not shit gold. Yep. So good, dude. That's it. That felt like such a throwback storytelling line, yep. didn't it? Like at the end of the story and it turned out that you know, it's it just, was a, it was a little bit gimmicky but it it's was a little like wink wink like a yeah, yeah. It, it was it's very much like a nod to like it, I don't it was know. the kind of one-liners that you get from bond movies where it's yeah. like a little too like would you really say that in the moment like, yeah i think it does fit with Tyrion's personality of a little quip because he was constantly thinking about like during heinous things even blackwater he has like really dark humor and I think that it does fit, but it certainly is like a wink kind of moment for the reader. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see if anything happens. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, people say Tywin was dying. It was Elena or uh, Oberyn was poisoning him. Uh, I know some people think it's Elena. I think it's Oberyn. I mean, Oberyn was clearly there to kill. And also Tywin. clearly had access to poisons. See the mountain. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, Elena definitely could be as well because we I mean, she's the one that poisoned Joffrey. Let's be. Yeah, honest. but she the she did it with help. Yes. Yes. Whereas so. like if it was a one man operation, it would be Oberyn. It yeah. was. Yeah, but ultimately it was still her, though, because they when Peter's talking to Sansa, like who adjust like think about it, like who was there and then remembers that like Elena had adjusted her necklace or whatever. And she talks about the reigns of Castamere constantly. Mm-hmm. She's like, oh, play it again. We haven't heard it enough tonight. And she requests. Which also it. is just like funny because she's like, I've forgotten the words since an hour. Like It's been an hour yeah. since it was, I was like, oh, she has honestly the lines that made me laugh the most. Yeah. And I, I like that Var- Varys is kind of in the backseat of this book quite a bit. But it's also really good to see him like in the tunnels because he sells out to remember in the trial. He sells him out and then helping him get he out. He's like documents. But he's got like a heap of evidence. It's like. <laughs> Day one, here's what this little shit did. Like, day 817. But like, I love how <laughs> often Varys is present when he's not present with how everyone's concerned with where they are and that little yeah. birds wouldn't be As able to hear them. How the gods would is where Sansa had to be because there's no walls. Yeah. The fact that we see these tunnels and everyone always went, oh, this is how he sees it. This is how he hears it. Like, there's all this, like, he's not even around. He's not in the scene. But people are always, like, worried about, like, is this in his web? Like, is this part of the world he has access to? So First person... Anyone? Cersei thinks of, you know, where where the hell, and I think it might be in Feast, but you know, where the hell's Varys at? Mm-hmm. Um, which which it makes sense. I mean, well, it Varys also like is... I like it because it there's there's a fine line to walk between giving somebody too much information, the, somebody being the reader, too much information and not enough. Because like just having this myth of Varys that he just knows everything all the time, like that does help to give him some enigma and to make it more interesting. But if it's just constantly like, how does he just like know everything all the time? And you're like, well, because he does don't ask questions. Magic. But we've seen enough now glimpses where like, it's still not the whole picture, but like you've seen some of the passages, like passageways, you've seen some of who he works with. So you have an idea like this is, reasonable like i have an idea of how he's accomplishing this but you still haven't told me everything how he's yeah. figured everything out yeah. we just don't know everything about his past and or like how he even knows that these passages exist like how does he have access to this network 
Yeah, and he's definitely has all kinds of different motives. Uh, I think it's obvious that he, yeah, he's for the realm and he's for young Griff, as we'll Mm -hmm. see later down the line. Uh, And he was, well, well, there's no Griff in this book. Uh, Well, I'm not. Yeah, we'll see. If you don't know, then you'll you'll figure it out. But I mean, he, you know, and then what happens at the very end of a dance and all this other stuff sir Isn't we are he... at storm of swords i know i'm th- i'm chomping at the bit because i i think i know that people don't necessarily love book four and five but it's the book that we have the most to like postulate on and five is more about. interesting than feast because stuff happens which is it's interesting you say that though because danny dance is the on. star of dance yeah, yeah but there's still other stuff going on there is there's a ton of stuff that happens feast is so it's such a dead zone i think I'll it's say, a- it's at that point, though, is when you it's like all you're left with are theories. So like, that's why it's like, well, what the hell is going to happen in wins? Like, that's yeah. where a lot of that comes from. We'll never know. Wins has probably about three or four battles that will happen, at least two at the very beginning. I mean, w- wins is going to be the storm of swords for this arc in a lot yeah. of ways. And then a you dream know. of spring should be the overarching ending. But I don't know if you could even wrap all this up in two books, to be honest. Because so Shinobi adds even more new things in winter. <laughs> well, we're getting we're getting some pretty cool perspectives. I don't know if they'll last long. We already times. we know what happens. Danny forgets about the Iron Fleet. <laughs> you know? I I uh, I feel like I'm excited the most about going forward. Obviously, Jamie chapters. Yep. Yes. I I'm excited to look at Cersei with a different light, um, because she's just not the smartest. Um, and she I'm also sure wants it real bad. <laughs> she sure does. I also really am looking forward to reading the songs of chapters to see more about Baelish and figuring out what's going to happen there and trying to figure out where they're going to end up. Because I think that's another thing in the show that's completely different. Yeah. It doesn't where again, really the casting is amazing and wasted. It doesn't make sense to, to do what they did in the show. Like no. why would, why would Peter well, Sans is also not with Ramsey. So, I mean, it's just like well, totally saying, but like that. But also, Peter also wouldn't do that. Ramsey Bolton casting is perfect. But like, as, as far as what you know from like book Peter Baelish, he would never put Sansa in that position. No, nope. ever. Nope, not nope. a chance. And also, the way uh, Baelish is written off in the show is uh, we don't know what to do with him. We're going to get rid of him because yeah. the shocking death scene. Wow. Yeah, they had murdered expectations. <laughs> they nailed really, really it. Really well, they, they really abandoned the, the plan for him, I think. They wanted to go a different way and, and make things more concise. Mm-hmm. And uh, it ended up hurting his arc, especially. I mean, they, did it, they did it to Varys, too. Yep. Varys being the master I mean, whisperers. He was hardly like, the caught. worst served by the ending of all the characters. Well, sir, yeah, that's fair. I think it's safe to say that there are loose things that we know are going to happen in the books that haven't happened yet from yeah. the show. But yeah. a lot of it, I think, is total just fabrication. Well, also the things that, like we've said before, the context is so important. And so, okay, so what if like this thing happens yeah. in the books? Because the context surrounding that thing happening will be so utterly different that it will be a different thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I, I've said it forever. Like I could totally see Danny burning King's Landing yeah. to the ground. But getting to that point has to make sense. Mm-hmm. It can't yeah. be a heel turn in three episodes of a show. Yeah, <laughs> like it's true. You know, or sorry, in like the last thirty seconds of her attack. <laughs> what yeah. will never yeah. happen is they're never going to send Dothraki out in front of the trebuchets in the middle of the night to just mm-hmm. die for no fucking. But they reason. didn't die. They all came back. It's okay. I'm banking on the fact that uh, we had a respawn in King's Landing. That Jamie's dream is maybe foreshadowing that we get the Long Night in uh, in King's Landing because that would be sick. But I mean, the, so that also means that so if that happens, that means the wall comes down, and that means they get all the way to King's Landing. So they just wreck house across all of Westeros to get to King's Landing, unless they just ignore half of it. Because <laughs> there's a lot on the way to King's Landing, like yeah. I still want to see it happen, but I don't know. Because then we have to use, like, there's, we'll, we'll talk about this in later books, but like, there's so much that has to happen between, like, where Dance ends and Wins a Winner and or Dream of Spring of, like, Tyrion and Danny haven't met. Like, we, I know we brought this up before, but that's, a lot has to happen. Yeah, a ton, a ton has to happen. And there's a lot more players in the game. Oh yeah, there's there's way more characters in the books that just didn't even exist. So, Lady yeah. Stoneheart, right? Oh god, so good. And and yeah, the epilogue for this book is just it's fantastic, chilling. 
chilling. And it's one of the only moments that we get. I mean, we get the Taiwan death, which is huge, but it's also a heart part of what makes it chilling is that it's like, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's really come up that much in these lives, but like very recently, I've just been complaining nonstop about books that are too one note that are like either all jokes or all drama. And it's just mm -hmm. like neither hits very hard. If that's all you're doing, it's having a good balance of both that makes them both more funny and more dark because you've had both mm -hmm. um, kind of like salty and sweet, you know, like heightens both. And so like, I feel like the epilogue because it is kind of like funny, like the way you like when he shows up, he's this bumbling guy. And like when he realizes they're going to kill him, they're like laughing at him and you're like, yeah, what'd you think was going to happen? Like, I'm pretty sure he's not going to fall for the same trick twice. So yeah, we're going to kill you. Like it's funny. And then Lady funny. Stoneheart happens and you're like, Oh, because like if the whole thing had just been like dread and creep and oh no, it's this like it would have been like, I guess that's creepy. But like it's the that like sudden change of tone. that's like, oh, shit. Well, you get them like describing her and then saying like she can't talk like he opened her throat too wide for her to do that. So you just see this corpse with like a giant throat ripped open. And There's a great illustration in the illustrated edition. Oh, it's so one good. of the one of the very few in that in that book that I really, really so like. Good. But it's also just like she's so mad that she just like <laughs> refuses to stay dead. It's yeah. so good. Yeah, like, she don't speak. Fun. You bastards cut her throat too deep for that. <clears throat> oh, and then we get we finally get some stark vengeance. Like finally. I mean, the power that she has to just nod, like the fact that like was he there? Mm -hmm. Judgment, Forest. Judgment Day. And it's interesting that Ned Dane is not for it and is not like the revenge, the vengeance spree. And I'm curious to see where he'll crop up, especially considering the fact that he's most likely supposed to be Dark Star. Yeah. Um, I can't wait to talk about Dorn. Oh, my God. Like Starfall, the whole thing. Sword of the Morning. I, I think all that yeah. stuff is very, very interesting. I think the. Did you, is it in your. Uh folio edition no i'm pretty sure it's a, it's the last illustration in, in this one yes that one she's it's like she's holding flowers she's and she looks like at the grim reaper i know she does it's creepy and like those illustrations books are very stylized they're not my favorite I, I, they're all like one. the like cross like i don't even know it's yeah, I don't even know the name for it, but it's a very stylized form of art. I don't love it, but that picture itself is that picture phenomenal. Is good. So good. Yeah. You can that feel the grief. Sweet. Well, we covered it all. We did it. Like a sad scarecrow. <laughs> sad sc well, um, we did the book. We did the whole thing. All the stuff that's in it. Um, and I'm kind of impressed that we um, that we're we did doing it all, great. Lauren. We're doing all the things. Yeah, um, we're doing Dunkin' Egg. We're doing Fire and Blood. World. Egg. Are we doing World of Ice on Fire? Are we doing it? I don't we're stretching know. it long it's, enough to that when we're is, finally got done everything that's published, Winds of Winter will be out, and then we can do that. Too. Is the World stay. of Ice and Fire actually canon? It is, is it considered. It's canon. Are we also going to do the cookbook of Westeros? Uh, actually, Ben the Knee had uh, videos where they cook some of the bowl brown and stuff. It's pretty funny. Lemon cakes for Sansa. <laughs> that sounds delicious. <laughs> I want to try bowl brown without the wrap meat. The only thing I have just I was just thinking when reading these books, like some of the times when they're talking about food, I'm like, is this a food that that George has had? Like, does he <laughs> has? What is this? <laughs> I'm a big fan of uh, of food in my like, fantasy. The number of meats that are poached in almond milk. I'm like, is that a thing you do? <laughs> like, what? It's up Maybe. in the cabin, just hanging out. River reads very enthusiastic. Yeah, I guess the, the plan is to at least do all of the like story style books. Yeah, we're definitely doing Dunkin' Egg and Fire and Blood. I think we should do Fire and Blood last because we might actually, if we do that, we might be like right at the release of House of the Dragon, which when apparently House of the Dragon, House of the Dragon is supposed to come out anywhere between March to September. Okay, because we got we'll That's be done with this. Not to put too fine a point on it. Well, they just wrapped <laughs> filming, and George has seen the first episode. Okay, well the main series will be done with February. February that would put Fire and Blood in the probably do... March, like right before the show starts. February. Well, we could do um, Dunkin' Egg in March if you want, and then do Fire and Blood in April. What about World of? And we can do World of. Yeah, I'm that's down. like an encyclopedia. It's not even like a. There's no like story. It's a gorgeous book, though, man. Oh, I love it. It has the best illustrations. It was half off of Barnes and Noble today. Yeah, hard covers. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I'm down to do World of Ice Fire, of course. Um, if you guys want to do, it. and maybe we can do World of Ice Fire slash, you know. 
talking about what we think is going to happen. Or... Thanks, Google. Hey, guys, the show comes out in 2022. Yeah. It seems like people are saying it's probably going to be in the spring. Um, but then I also saw some people say they don't know. I, it wrapped up filming at the beginning of this month. So I mean, I, I have a dream that it's going to be spring. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> Solid. That was. That was hey. Cool. Let me have this. <laughs> I'm 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 very excited for House of the Dragon. I think reading Fire and Blood will be really cool. Um, right before that, isn't I, I haven't I've avoided it kind of like looking at trailers or anything. But isn't um, uh, what's his name who played Matt Smith? Matt Smith. Isn't he in it? Yeah, he's Damon Targaryen, and mm -hmm. uh, everyone's back from the show except D and D. <laughs> like the entire thing, like the score is going to be the same. Sean Bean, the guy who directed <laughs> um most of I the mean, battles, Blackwater yeah. Bay. It's going to be really good really excited um my my only curiosity is if they're going to be an episode it's going to be an episodic thing where each season they tell a story from fire and blood i think that's what they're going to do personally um but a lot of people also feel like they're going to just do the dance of dragons yeah so, i mean the dance of dragons is probably going to be the main focus and it depends on how many like because we, we know that a bunch of other potential prequels essentially got scrapped already that they were going to do yeah it kind of depends on i guess like the success of this i was going to say i'm sure like it's going to be written the first season be written in a way where like it's can kind of stand on its own ish yeah. but then there's enough left over if it does well that they can do more yeah i think that that's probably very likely a duncan egg got a green light so that's going to happen now okay. um and there's supposed to be some sort of um animation series from hbo and a lot of people think it's going to be probably something a lot more mystical uh, to save on budget like the long night might actually end up being that which would be really really cool um house of the dragon number one search show it's uh it's the and most one more game of thrones man they Every, do everybody wants to watch well, the... i think it's because it's been long enough because if yeah. it's, this had been like right after season eight we're gonna be like fuck you but like it's been long enough to people like okay but it was good and we miss when it was good and we'd like more good <laughs> and, if, and if you don't look at the pop culture internet a lot of people were fine oh, with yeah. season eight. Like my in-laws were fine with it. Stupid. I got a friend. Well, it's, I mean, it's whatever they're into. You know what I mean? I, I have a friend. He's same age as us. He doesn't, yeah. he doesn't read Twitter. Doesn't read Reddit. He doesn't give a shit about online. And he's like, well, season eight was great. He yeah, like, doesn't have any problems. Life will be much happier if you don't listen to the right. dredge of the internet. How about this? I'm, I, if I'm being completely honest, there were obviously things I didn't like. I didn't despise season eight when I first watched it because I wasn't really talking to people online about it. I did because I was all of like I've I'm up and down. The, I had problems in fire subreddit mm -hmm. and the free folk subreddit and just like living and dying by like theories for years. And then finally, like season seven. I ended on kind of like a, I don't, I don't, I didn't love the yeah. fact that they were doing like 13 episodes split between two seasons to wrap it all up. And when season seven ended and leaks started to drop for season eight, I gave in and I started reading the leaks and I was like, dude, if this is true, I'm going to be so mad and disappointed. <laughs> and like when, like the first two episodes, I was like, okay, this is actually kind of good. Like when they're all in Winterfell and like they're singing. That was the last good episode. And, like, Jenny and the all, old. They're stars. all having like good conversations. I was like, this kind of feels like Game of Thrones again. And then I had read all the leaks for the long night. And as soon as it started happening, I was like, oh my God, it's actually all happening exactly like the leak said. I think uh, uh, Steve did like this the whole time. I was just like, oh my God. I mean, I really hated it. I wasn't in like. Uh in tune with like anything on the internet or anything but like i stopped watching the show pretty much when it went off book because i just was like eh, is this real i don't know and it wasn't like a conscious like i refuse i was just like i don't feel like eh. so i just kind of stopped watching and then like when the final season was going to be happening i was like well i kind of want to it was like fomo like i want to be in it with everybody so then i binged everything like literally in a weekend yeah so that i could catch up for the season finale so like i in a very short amount of time saw the rapid decline in quality like when it's like condensed like that for you when you're like it's good and then it's oh it is not good by the end of the weekend <laughs> so yeah. then when i got to like season eight's finale i was like no even, no. If, even if you don't even if you don't hate what they did with it like it's it's clear that it went from being like a smart political like a smart kind of show to a delving you're just gonna do action movie set pieces like Oh yeah, epic scenes. Like I love the loot train episode because I love seeing the Dothraki come up over that hill and just annihilate a Lannister army. Like it's so cool. 
it doesn't really make You've sense broken Jimmy. that it happened, but like I go back and I watch that fight all the time because I, I I'm a sucker for like cavalry charges in movies and shows. So that whole thing and like so the Battle of Helm's Deep. Oh, I, I watch it all the time, and I watch Minas Tirith. I, I watch all of it all the time. But um, or or like the Last Samurai. I watch that final fight all the with time. The coming on the third day when Gandalf <laughs> shows up with Aomir. I love it. A good cavalry charge though. Even the, I mean, the Battle of Bastards, like, that was sick. Um, but just for me, like, the, the way that it ended, making so many characters dumb, and just sort of, like, streamlining everything, just kind of pissed me off. From a spectacle, it's it's cool. And, like, my well, wife... I mean, nothing in terms it. of, like, costumes or visual effects or any no, of that went down. Great. It was all, you know, premiere of television. Course. Yeah, but. I don't know. It, um, it left a sour taste in my mouth. But I, I don't know. I was kind of like willing to dislike it, I guess. And then just constantly surrounding myself with more more people disliking it. Like, I'm sure that helped form my opinion. But there's just so many like logical fallacies in the ending of that show. But um, when it could, like, it, I feel like it could have been amazing. And They could even have out. streamlined and simplified things and not made it that dumb. I agree. But I mean, obviously it worked for like, most I mean, the fact that literally in that interview, which of whichever of the two of them it was, was like, "Well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet." I'm like, "If you're you, do you hear yourself? Yeah. Like, what?" <laughs> I mean, that's 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 really dumb. And in fact, I mean, you're literally flying with dragons. Like, you can see a ship. That's, you also, can't, like, you can't it was like the episode part. before where they had you know the the map laid out with like their you know where their placements of the armies and ships mm -hmm. are and they literally had the iron fleet on that map and you're like yeah. i mean there is there's a lot of dumb things that happen and i think that's not the actor's fault that's not the show's fault it was like the people writing the episode I, I, I don't well know that's what's so painful that. about it is when you see how much money and talent because mm -hmm. the people who were doing the visual effects the people who are doing the costume the people who are doing the acting the people who are doing literally everything that quality never went down it yeah. was only the writing but even, even like the Okay, so, like, even if you take away the fact that, like, you thought the long night was fun and, like, you enjoyed the episode. Fun is they, a weird word for that, but sure. They literally charged an entire army of Dothraki into the dark and they all died. And then the next episode, there were, like, 50,000 Dothraki alive. Like, that makes no sense. There is no way in life that you can convince me that that makes any goddamn sense. Because Danny's giving her her Hail Hitler speech. And there's Dothraki and Unsullied sitting there. It's like they mostly all died. No, they mostly this. all lived. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. But it kind of, I mean, okay, we were talking about these comedians before we started the live, but Mitchell and Webb, the one of the two, David Mitchell, he used to have this YouTube um, series called David Mitchell Soapbox where he would just rant about stuff. And, um, this like when Jimmy said that, you know, most of most people who like don't read the books and like don't pay attention to Reddit, like actually mm -hmm. had no problem with season eight. It, I felt like David Mitchell ranting about season two of Downton Abbey because he was saying how like season one of Downton Abbey, you know, like it's, you know, it's fine. It's like it's a pretty good show with some pretty good historical accuracy, some pretty good human drama. You know, it's pretty it's pretty good, um, pretty quality television, all things considered. And then the second season is wild and just starts hemorrhaging history and nothing makes sense. And he's like, and you know what? No one cared. Everyone just went on with it like it was just fine. And he's like, which makes the first season really the shameful one, because what's the point of making something that is like quality and considerate in its detail, etc., when all Downton Abbey is is a vehicle for delivering Maggie Smith in a hat? Like, if that's all people are here for, why bother with good writing? <laughs> Pretty much. Hey, Jimmy. I think you're muted, bro. Yes, I have been muted. Um, Were you talking? Because we did not know. I, I didn't say much. Oh, I didn't okay. say much. Um, yeah, I think that wraps up a Storm of Swords, though. I think that, that that's a that's a wrap. Ended on Downton Abbey as we knew we would. <laughs> <laughs> well, everyone, thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Go make sure to hit up Alex and Lena's channels. I'm sure you're already subscribed, but you should subscribe anyways. Their channels are linked down in the description. Alex, Lena, thank you so much for stopping by, and I'm having a blast with this read along. It's a good time. The Feast for Crows will be back on the Ennis channel. Yes, so. back on Lena's channel at the end of January. 
And then we're saving the second biggest book for February, which is a short month. So that'll be interesting to see how I fit that in with Malazan. So just don't read anything else. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably gonna be a two book month for me. <laughs> just audiobook it all time of the day. Oh, but but Roy. But, Roy is and that was right before he died. He was he was struggling real bad. You can feel the decline even in Feast. You can, you can say it what didn't start out great. Oh yeah, he was already at a low point. He was like way up here. <laughs> All right, everyone, be good and be safe. Uh, make sure to hit the like button so people can find this after the fact. It does help it in the old uh, algorithm or whatever it might be by the old gods and the new. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time for a Feast for Crows on Lena's channel. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. <laughs>